Before we begin, I want to remind the committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct for meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage with co in conversation with the chair, council members, board members, or staff. All members of the committee and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting will result in removal from this meeting. This meeting of the Transportation and Environment Committee will now come to order. Can we please have a roll call? Foley? Here. Perales? Here. Esparza? Here. Cohen? Here. Davis? Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, there are no items recommended to be added, dropped, or deferred in the review of the work plan. There are also no items on the consent calendar. So unless my members have any comments, we will move directly to reports to the committee. The first report is item D1, status report on deferred maintenance and infrastructure backlog. Matthew, are you kicking it off for us? Yes, Chair uh, Davis. Hi, my name is Matthew Nguyen. Um, thank, thank you, Chair Davis, and uh, good afternoon, uh, committee members. My name is Matthew Nguyen. I'm a Deputy Director for Public Works, and today co-presenting with me will be Walter Lin, Deputy Director for Public Works, Sarah Sellers, Division Manager for PRNS, and Rick Scott, Deputy Director for um, DOT. So the, the Deferred Maintenance and Backlog Report first, was first created in 2007, and it was updated and reported out annually since then. This is a living document and it capture all of the needs that we identify in our system. And it will be continue to be updated and um, evaluated by staff annually. And uh, staff continue to try to come up with, um, you know, more accurate information so that we can have a better understanding of our system and our needs. Um, this table here is showing our current backlog need. Um, the middle column is showing the one-time backlog need, and also the column on the right is showing annual unfunded need. Um, so the one-time backlog need as of this year is identified as $1.6 billion. Uh, this is a slight reduction from last year it's reduced by about 4% from last year. And this is largely <clears throat> based on the reduction in transportation infrastructure needs that will be discussed by DOT later on. Uh, on the ongoing annual unfunded need, um, it's a reduction of about 1.4% from last year. 
Uh, here's another way to look at our infrastructure backlog. Uh, just a quick disclaimer here is you, there's an error on the chart. Um, you can see that there's a big deficit in fleet. Actually, that high column of, in, in orange color, it should belong to the park pool and open space adjacent to it. So sorry about that. Um, so you can see that there are four areas that have a large deficit in the, in the city. Uh, going from left to right is building facilities, park pool open space, uh, storm sewer system and transportation infrastructure. So in the next few slides, staff will discuss about these four uh, programs. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Walter Lin. He will be talking about um, building facilities. Thank you so much, Matthew. And good afternoon, Chair Davis and members of the Transportation and Environment Committee. Uh, my name is Walter Lin. I'm a Deputy Director in Public Works. And I'll be sharing with you the details of the building facilities that Public Works man, man, uh, maintains. Uh, this is exclusive of the airport and the regional wastewater facility, uh, but includes the categories of facilities that you see here, including uh, the public safety facilities, police and fire, uh, city hall, the cultural facilities, um, PRNS and library sites, the animal care services facility uh, as well. Um, with these sites, uh, as you know, uh, they are quite antiquated for the majority of our building inventory. And unfortunately, with older buildings, we have the older building systems as well, uh, which our job within Public Works is to maintain these facilities to ensure uh, an operable and safe user experience uh, for staff, members of the public, visitors. Um, we just want to make sure that they are functioning as they should, and they provide that level of safety um, as well for each facility. Any type of life safety um, issues that occur, uh, we do treat that as our highest priority, our priority one work orders uh, that we uh, would address and at least safe off to the point where there's no longer the danger to staff or the public or to the equipment itself, preventing uh, further damage. Uh, and then going back and making the proper repair when possible and as the budgets uh, uh, provide us to do so. Uh, but as you can see, as much as we can try to do on a proactive preventative maintenance uh, schedule, um, we do not have enough resources, unfortunately. And as such, you're seeing these larger dollar amounts still for these aged facilities uh, where we are more so in the reactive mode, uh, doing reactive maintenance, uh, building uh, systems repairs uh, or replacements as required. Um, you can see here with the PRNS facilities almost at $180 million. Um, um, dollars. And I'm sorry, uh, we do manage 400 buildings and as, as shown there, 5 million square feet of uh, space. Uh, for the PRNS sites, uh, we're at almost $180 million in uh, building needs. Team San Jose, uh, that is $73.5 million. Police facilities at almost $9 million. City Hall at over $8 million. Uh, fire departments at $9 million. Cultural facilities at 13.8 million, the library branches um, at 33 million, and then the animal care services at uh, just under $3 million. Um, that being said, though, we understand that as newer infrastructure and newer square footage comes into the building's inventory, we are trying to build in a better work plan and resources around that, such as the new Measure T facilities. We are looking at staffing resources and how to best maintain those facilities, even when new just to ensure that those building systems last as long as they should. And we benchmark uh, doing as much building condition assessment work as possible to determine how long building systems should last based on what type of equipment it is and trying to build that preventative maintenance program a bit better uh, to ensure that those building systems last and we don't need to have replacements as early and we get that useful life uh, out of those uh, particular building systems. Matthew, if you can advance to the next slide. Uh, this slide just shows a few examples of what we do maintain on the building exterior and interior. Uh, this is just a photo of the uh, police administration building with the communications building in the background. Uh, we cover it all in terms of exterior and interior of the building, uh, of the building site, uh, from roofing, outdoor lighting. Uh, with many of the uh, facilities, we, are, uh, we do have the allocation for Measure T to upgrade the exterior lighting of, building, uh, of buildings parks and trails to new LEDs and um, automated controls. 
Uh, elevator systems, unfortunately, they are aged. We are having more problems with those uh, types of equipment and systems, plumbing systems and electrical. Uh, emergency generators as well, as we start moving towards more of that look for resiliency and building sustainability at the same time, uh, we are looking at what facilities uh, we do have to maintain with existing uh, diesel generators, but also looking forward in terms of what we're doing uh, from the more sustainable side and the microgrid program is still evolving uh, for those facilities that don't quite have backup generation at this point. Uh, the exterior shell and HVAC air conditioning systems, uh, fire alarm systems as well. For solar systems, we do have those on several of our facilities to help uh, offset some of the PG&E uh, needs. Uh, that also builds into our resiliency aspect as well. Pavement and hardscape, unfortunately, with uh, older pavements, uh, it is getting worn. And the more foot traffic, vehicle traffic, et cetera, uh, those hardscape and pavement areas uh, will need to be uh, replaced uh, and, and repaired accordingly. Uh, and then the interior building uh, systems as well, too. As mentioned, we maintain over 400 buildings and over 500, uh, 5 million square feet. Uh, this is in addition to the service yards and other facilities that we manage as well. Uh, the total deferred maintenance uh, as calculated at this point is just under 329 million for these facilities. And with that, I'd like to transition it to Sarah Sellers in uh, Paraness to talk about the parks infrastructure needs. Thank you, Walter. My name is Sarah Sellers. I'm the division manager for the capital team in parks, recreation and neighborhood services. Many of you are familiar with San Jose's extensive park system, but as a reminder, we have 209 parks that includes neighborhood and regional parks, as well as golf courses and open space. We also have an extensive trail system of over 61 miles of paved trail. And within our parks, we have a number of assets, including basketball hoops, bocce courts, tennis, sports fields, playgrounds, exercise equipment, etc. The city is also home to six aquatic facilities. Um, so those are pools and the related infrastructure. And of course, we have community gardens and skate parks and an assortment of other goodies. Two attractions stand out that are in our inventory. We have San Jose Family Camp, which is located in the Sierra Nevada mountains a few hours outside of the city, and Happy Hollow Park and Zoo, which is home to a handful of really cute critters, including a jaguar, and an alligator. Next slide, please. And of course, all of that to say, we have many, many needs. We have a very large inventory and our infrastructure backlog number continues to grow. We're working from a 2013 report to update those numbers. Um, we are prioritizing a lot of renovation projects to try and get ahead of this. But behind the scenes, we're really looking at cleaning up our data and assessing things on an individual basis. So last year, we were able to pilot a park condition assessment process, which broke out capital infrastructure from maintenance items and took a deeper dive into assessing items like playgrounds, sports courts, and exercise equipment. We also piloted a trail assessment project. So we're hoping that having cleaner data will help us have a cleaner inventory and will lead to refining these numbers in the future. As of this year, the subtotal for parks is roughly 260 million. Adding that with our community centers, restrooms, and other minor park buildings, we're adding another roughly 163 million for a grand total of 424 million for the PRNS backlog. Uh, and with that, I'll pass it along to Matthew for the storm sewer infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, in the city, we have over a thousand miles of uh, storm sewer system pipelines and over 30 pump stations, as well as a series of curb and girder inlets, outfalls, um, flat gate. So it, it's quite a large system that we have in the city. And in the past, we have identified a total of $215 million of backlog um, for in the system. And with the Measure T approval in 2019, that one-time backlog has been reduced to $180 million, and it remained the same since. Um, <clears throat> so as of this time, um, we also identify a series of ongoing capital improvements that we need 
to support our outfalls, pump stations, flat gates. Uh, it clocked in at about $5 million annually. Um, so that's what we have in our report. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to Rick Scott to discuss um, transportation infrastructure. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, good afternoon, committee members and members of the public. My name is Rick Scott, and I'm the Deputy Director in DOT for Infrastructure Maintenance. Uh, the slide you see here provides a visual overview of the many assets managed and maintained in the transportation network. Uh, most of these assets remained at similar numbers from last year, but I, I'd like to point out that uh, the LED streetlights have gone up from 64,000 to about 65,600, and, and that's been finalized over the last couple of weeks. That's not been updated here yet. Um, all of which, again, the 65,600 lights will be converted to LED in the coming months. Um, the large drivers of our maintenance responsibility, if you were to look at the numbers on the next slide, which is our pavement maintenance miles, that has not changed, unlike last year where we did have an increase. Uh, next slide, please. So the DOT maintenance backlog actually decreased pretty substantially this past year. Uh, 31.5 million of that is attributable to the work that our teams have accomplished on paving, ADA wrap updates and bridge maintenance. Uh, but the bridge maintenance rehabilitation asset class in particular fell by $75 million alone, primarily due to a new way that Caltrans uh, calculates maintenance needs. They perform all of our inspections every two years. So according to the most recent inspection, San Jose now only has two bridges, which would be in poor condition, neither of which present safety concerns to our residents. So our maintenance backlog has fallen by over $100 million uh, this past year to $736.9 million in DOT. We anticipate the maintenance backlog to continue decreasing year over year while Measure T funds remain in place. And uh, actually in March, our team did provide an updated pavement maintenance report with in-depth analysis, including a 10-year projection uh, this past TNE meeting in March. Uh, so we won't be going into more detail on that today. So with that, I believe that covers it, Matthew, unless there's anything else, we're ready for questions. Yes. We'll go to members of the public first. Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Happy April to everyone. Uh, I, I think in the first part of this item, you were talking about uh, building infrastructure efficiencies that you're doing uh, within city government buildings and stuff. Uh, it was nice to hear. Um, I just wanted to quickly remind, I don't know if this quite could be applicable. You can stop me if you need it. That, um, Martha O'Connell has been speaking at public comment a few times about the future of uh, efficient electricity practices and the future of buildings in San Jose. She's looking for some clarification on that issue and how it relates to like mobile home, mobile home park issues. And I hope that uh, she can connect with, you know, people of San Jose Community Energy and, and like-minded, uh, as perhaps the commission process and like-minded people, and, and there can be a really uh, a melding of minds on that issue and, and what needs to be worked out, because Martha seems she has some serious uh, concerns, and I just thought I would mention it this time, and uh, I think uh, the, uh, an electric building future is a really interesting idea, and I hope uh, uh, Margaret and, and all the people who are working on that issue can, can get together and, and work things out. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I see no more members of the public with their hands raised, so I will call on Councilmember Foley. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the backlog report, which is a little disappointing, but I understand we never have enough money to do all of these capital improvement projects that we need to do. But I do have some questions about specific numbers. Can you pull up the slide that shows the list of different uh, categories and then the dollar amounts attached to them. There's there's one uh, with Team San Jose that says 73.5 million. Can you give me an idea of what the, what that is, what the work is that is backlogged or the maintenance, deferred maintenance is? That's a big number. Yes, uh, Council Member Foley, this is Walter Lynn with Public Works. I can help answer that question. Thanks, Walter. Uh, Team San Absolutely, Council Member Foley. 
Um, so on the top of page nine within the report, it goes through the details of the various facilities and the dollar amounts. They are big ticket amounts with the largest coming from the uh, Center for Performing Arts. That particular facility, unfortunately, it is old. The building systems are quite aged. Uh, the facility can use quite a bit of improvements. Of that 73 and a half million, 42 and a half comes from uh, the Center for Performing Arts. I know in past DMIB uh, meetings, there's an inquiry on what it might cost to just start over, demo that facility if the cost is so, so large. Our architectural team, our architectural engineering team did do that analysis and it would be over a hundred million dollars, uh, I believe, if I recall correctly, uh, to start over. Um, so there is still value in reusing the existing sites, although this dollar amount is quite huge. One project in particular for Team San Jose and the Center for Performing Arts that we are focusing on uh, more immediately is the chiller system at the center at, at the CPA. Uh, that one unfortunately has uh, really gone beyond the end of life. Uh, to put it in perspective, our team is estimating construction costs as well as design and engineering uh, to be over seven million dollars just for that one project. Um, so unfortunately, uh, with the current times and the estimates that we're putting together with our teams, uh, it is uh, quite a bit expensive, unfortunately, for, for some of these projects. Uh, Walter, thank you for that information. And with regards to the Center of Performing Arts, when you, it, it it's, uh, sounds like it's functionally obsolescent as um, uh, currently designed, but uh, there's some historical uh, construction in that building too. So I'm sure the preservationists would not want it to be destroyed, but I do appreciate, and nor, nor would I, I it's kind of a, a, kind of a fun building, but uh, I'm, I do appreciate that you did the analysis to determine, well, if we tore it down and rebuild, could we, we could build it better in that we can use new technology and maybe uh, make it a LEED certified building, but, but uh, in, given that the cost is so high, it doesn't make sense. So I appreciate that. I, I appreciate that you're doing the analysis on that. Um, with regards to City Hall, and I'm sorry if this is in the report and I didn't catch it, it's the the dollar is 8.1 million for City Hall. What does that, what, uh, what is that uh, detailed consists of? What What work needs to be done there? Yes, uh, Councilmember Foley. So there are quite a few projects, even though City Hall is not quite 20 years old, we are approaching 17 years at this point, uh, this coming summer. Uh, so not very old, but not very young, unfortunately. And with the uh, with the run times on the building systems, they are getting deteriorated, they are getting antiquated. Uh, there are upgrades as well too. Even though the systems were built with state-of-the-art in mind back in the early 2000s, those have also become antiquated, unfortunately, with any type of technology. Uh, we are looking at um, controls upgrades, but in specific, specifically for City Hall, uh, we have some plumbing issues that we are trying to address. Carpeting, unfortunately, has worn and gotten to the point where we can't quite make repairs uh, as there are wrinkles, tripping hazards, fading, things of that nature. Uh, carpet is quite expensive, unfortunately, and depending on the square footage that we want to do, uh, we're looking at a project that is nearly 700000 just for City Hall uh, for carpeting. Uh, other projects, we do want to enhance security a bit with some additional infrastructure, um, newer cameras, maybe cameras where we have blind spots still within the campus. Um, there are um, mechanical system upgrades, in particular air conditioning system upgrades that we consider the Fort Street garage and the employee garage as part of the city hall campus because of the proximity and how we use those facilities. There are some mechanical system upgrades are needed at the uh, Fort Street garage in, partic in particular as it services the summit center. And that's a larger ticket amount as well too in the neighborhood of one and a half million dollars, uh, if not more. Uh, we are still looking at uh, some furniture replacement where needed. Um, and then exterior restoration, that is something to, to the best of our abilities when we have negative activities on the campus. Um, our facilities team, we do our very best job as well as with Beautify SJ to assist in cleaning up and restoring as much as we can on the building exterior. However, there's some damage and some graffiti that just won't come off as cleanly as we'd like. And as such, we're thinking of an exterior makeover, if you will. Uh, where we can enhance the look aesthetically 
and get it to a, a, a place where uh, some of the past uh, negative activities uh, and the residuals can, can be lifted off of the surface of the buildings. Okay, so it, it sounds like you're prioritizing uh, health and safety issues as it relates to City Hall, which I think is, is important. The, the plumbing, the carpet, uh, security cameras, things like that, removing the graffiti, those are all really important things. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Walter. And then I have one final question for Rick. And Rick, you mentioned two bridges. Which are the two bridges that uh, we have? So, so there are, we all, I thought we had more than two bridges, but you're saying the two bridges are the ones that we need to be concerned with, or, you, or you're saying yeah. they're okay? And which ones are they? There's two bridges that are, that would qualify for what's called a rehabilitation program project they don't need to be replaced okay. um, but they'll be re rehabilitated and we actually have a project scheduled for one of them to improve the condition it it might even not be poor after we do the work um so they're uh, gold street and guadalupe river up in the north part of the city and mm -hmm. then kind of to the southeast we've got ritter street at coyote creek sorry R ritter park drive at coyote creek that's another one that's considered to be in poor condition um again caltrans inspects every two years they've changed their recently changed their inspection criteria uh, and the categories. And so the, our, our bridges are in a lot better shape than we thought they were. So good. That, that's good news. That, that is good news. I won't get nervous then when I cross over any of those bridges. So thank, thank you for the, that news. And, and council member Cohn probably goes over the gold bridge more than, than I probably would. And that's kind of in his general area. Well, I, I want to thank you all for your presentation and uh, answers to my uh, questions. Very helpful. Uh, I wish we had more money that we could get to this maintenance more quickly, but I understand we can't. So I appreciate how you're organizing and planning these out to get more uh, efficiency and maximum dollars from the dollars we do have. Thanks. Member Cohen. Councilmember Foley, thanks. I, I wish you hadn't asked that question. Now I know that the two bridges that are on this list are in district four. Um, I actually, very few people at least well, I shouldn't say this. There are people who commute into San Jose on the Gold Bridge, Gold Street Bridge, but it's pretty far removed from the rest of us. Uh, Ritter Park, though, is pretty fairly heavily used. But anyway, I'd be, I'll be interested to, now, now that I've heard this, I'll be interested in getting a briefing at some point about how we're uh, addressing those, those bridges. Um, I also, you also mentioned the Summit Center. I, I, I noticed, obviously, I, I see, I go there periodically, and I notice the, uh, some of the issues, particularly two of the three elevators have been broken for the last month. So um, I, I, I hope that uh, we have that on our maintenance uh, <laughs> schedule. Um, I should say two of the three on the one bank of elevators. I know those two banks of elevators, but anyway. Um, my question is on the uh, wastewater treatment plant and airport. The report has a number zero for deferred maintenance needs. Um, obviously, I, you know, the number should never is never zero, I assume. Um, I know that the wastewater treatment plan, obviously, given all the upgrades and work that's been done, we're in decent shape there. But um, do we do we have a better feel for what the ongoing maintenance needs are in terms of um, ongoing investment? Uh, I'll start. I guess I can start with you, Carrie, since your camera just came on. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Um, we, we don't consider deferred, we only consider deferred maintenance for the wastewater facility um, for projects where we haven't identified funding and it's not on our plan. And so we certainly have a lot of work, as, as you know, to do to ensure the safe operation of the facility, but, um, but we have a plan to, uh, to address those and then we'll adjust uh, rates as needed to ensure that the highest priority things are, uh, are taken care of promptly. So we feel really good about uh, about how the infrastructure will be cared for over time. Okay, good. And at the airport, I saw that the question was more of one uh, of lack of full study of what needs to be done. Um, what is the, what do we think is the issue of the airport? I think the airport has been also been well-maintained, but do we have, um, do we believe that the number's low or do we think that there's something not yet in the report? I don't know who's here to answer that question, but. Um, I guess we'll have to bring it back. And okay. Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks. 
So uh, every year we get this report with this large backlog and big scary numbers. Um, and I know we're allocating measure T and measure B as appropriate to address some of the things in this backlog. And I know that that's helping us with our, with our roads. Are there some recommendations that come out of the study every year about what we might need to do as a city to begin to chip away at the most important issues so we don't let things get, get even more out of hand at our community centers and libraries and a lot of these buildings that are reaching this sort of 20 to 30 year timeline? Uh, Councilmember Cohen, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, that is where the continued condition assessment work, I think, comes into play, which unfortunately we ha haven't had as much resources to do so as we're more in the reactive mode than proactive mode. Uh, but that's the idea is to proactively look at the facilities, understand where they're at in their current life cycle. And that might not mean what the manufacturer indicates, well, this has a 25 or 30 year life. It's based on actual use deterioration and the current condition as it's reviewed at that point in time then determining how much usable, realistic usable life is still left in that system, then building that maintenance plan around that. Uh, if we can make that turn and start moving from reactive to proactive, that is where uh, we would um, uh, like the city to be at. Uh, but right now we're in that fine balance where um, as things break, uh, most of our resources are going towards the reactive, uh, fix the problem, save it, uh, get it to a usable operable condition. And at the same time in parallel, start looking at uh, maybe um, the budget requests to start looking at things a little bit more proactively and, and dedicating some resources uh, to that degree. As you mentioned, with specifically with the community facing sites, uh, community centers, libraries, and definitely our public safety facilities as well. And I know that as we go through the budget process each year, many of us know of things and we, we try to request some money for them, but maybe there should be some a more direct line of communication between the work that you're doing in the council offices to make sure that we know here are some high things that we think are high priority that you might not be aware of. You know, for example, an HVAC system here or a turf issue over there and allow our council offices to work on how we might put out a plan for funding over the coming years. Absolutely, Council Member Cohen, I, I welcome that partnership. Any additional information, eyes in the field, you know, eyes on the site that we might not be aware of, uh, we would love to have that information. We can work uh, and keep our list, you know, um, growing. And unfortunately, it's a very long list at this point, but we can continue adding and then prioritizing where it fits. Uh, if there's something that is on the more immediate schedule that needs replacement or major repair, uh, we can consider moving those uh, through the priority rankings. Obviously, anything that's a health life safety issue, we're going to attend to first. Uh, but yes, any additional information that we're not aware of, and if you and the site um, staff members or members of the public identify need um, public work. So we'd love to have that. And that can be shared with me directly and I can work with our teams. Um, and, and just to be clear, I wasn't necessarily suggesting that I wanted to lengthen your list. Um, although, and, and and I can't speak for the other council members, but I, I think we know of the things and we do usually try to, you know, through the budget process or through just directly talking to different departments, try to get those things addressed. I was thinking more along the lines of all the things on your lengthy list that we might not be aware of or that we're not necessarily putting in requests for having that communication from you to us by district might be helpful. That's a great idea as well too, uh, Councilman Cohen. Yes, uh, we, and we can prepare that. Uh, we have that list. It's a five-year running list that we have uh, that we could share. Also things that are getting into our work order system for repairs. Um, we, can, we can look to see how we can query that list and try to share that information as well. Yeah. All right, thank you. And to that point, Council Member Cohen, um, the Parks Department's really good about doing that months before we start the budget process so you can start thinking about it. So I think that's a good suggestion for, for other departments if they've got their lists and can sort of portion them out for us by council district, that would be really helpful. I know Parks already does that. I have a few um, just kind of bigger 30,000 foot view questions. There, there was some talk in the, in the parks. I think Sarah, you were talking about the parks being based on a 2013 report and being updated, but that more detailed information is um, still being developed. We've heard that now for a few years. And I know when I say a few years, that includes the years of the pandemic. So I'm just wondering what the timeline is for those, those uh, updated details. Yeah, thank you for your question. 
Um, so I think, you know, part of the challenge is we're piloting processes and then we get data, we review it, we refine it, we, you know, kind of play with it to make sure it's, it's truthful data that we can actually rely on. So I think now we're at the point where we have good data. The challenge is really how do we update our numbers if we've been calculating our current numbers based off of a 2013 report? I think that's kind of where we're at is we're ready to break away from the old report, um, but we haven't quite figured out the mechanism for how to clear everything up to say, this was the old report and this is our new report. Here's our numbers for something, for example, for sports courts versus trails versus exercise equipment. And now how does that compare with the old report? That's where we're at right now. It's been very confusing to try and tease things apart from the report. And I think we just, we're at a point where we need to make a decision to start fresh and take a new path forward or reconcile the old report with new data. I would, I would just suggest, and I'd love to hear what my colleagues think about this, but I would just suggest starting fresh. I mean, we're talking about nine years and nine years in which multiple things have happened um, that, that are pretty disruptive. So I wouldn't even, I, I don't think it's worth the time to do a reconciliation unless you think that there is going to be better information coming from a reconciliation, but just to reconcile so that we can compare the 2013 report with the 2022 or 2023 report. I honestly don't think it's worth spending the time. And I wouldn't say spin, I, I would say stop spinning your wheels on that and just move forward because the sooner we can get better numbers, the better it, those budget discussions that I referenced earlier will be. Um, so that that's just my two cents. I don't know what what other council members think about that, but I would just say, go forward. Um, and, you know, put the caveat in the, in the new report, too much has changed. And I, I just think it's important given the, um, the inflation that we experienced, not only just recently, but also before the pandemic on construction costs in our city. I, I think it's important to get those updated numbers. Um, I do have a kind of a, I'm not sure who, who can answer this? Maybe Walter, it's you. But as as Councilmember Cohen stated, you know, every year we get these big scary numbers, and I it did beg the question for me this year. And maybe I've asked you this before, but I assume that other large cities also have a backlog. I mean, as a homeowner myself, we we have a backlog of maintenance in our own home, and and often do some some proactive, I would say minor proactive, but mo much more reactive as you talked about um, spending on our on our home. And so I imagine that backlogs are not um, not zero in most cases in most cities. Where do we fall on that spectrum for other large cities in terms of backlog per square foot? That is a very interesting question, Councilmember Davis. I'll have to do some research in terms of where we might rank uh, to comparable size cities or larger cities within the nation and maybe specifically in the Bay Area. Um, I'm very curious about that as well too, what other cities backlogs might look at. Uh, to your point, and I agree, uh, again, the more um, preventative maintenance that we can do to extend the life of our existing building systems, that is definitely a goal of ours. Our preventative maintenance budget, though, is pretty slim. If I recall correctly, it's under a million dollars. So looking at it from the perspective of we have almost $330 million in uh, deferred maintenance, that's barely a third of 1% that we're looking at it from a pre uh, preventative maintenance cycle. And it's really just focused for certain building systems as well. Uh, not everything that we've shown in that slide with building shell, interior systems, et cetera. Um, so, uh, that is something that I can research and figure out uh, what other cities backlog uh, may be, um, comparatively speaking, in terms of uh, their building infrastructure, their square footage, the number of facilities that they have. Yeah, I would I would suggest that maybe if an intern had a spare afternoon that that might be something to look into, but not I wouldn't make it a high priority for for you. I know you have a lot more important things to do, but it just it just didn't make me wonder. And I do sit on the the retirement, um, the Federated Retirement Board as the liaison for the council. And we often talk about, you know, benchmarking ourselves in terms of um, not only our returns, but also our unfunded liability and that kind of thing. So just, it was just a question uh, that came up in my mind because 
I know that everybody's probably got some backlog. So just, you know, kind of how far behind we are, um, how it gives us a sense of how, how these big scary numbers, um, how, how worried they need to be in our priority list of what keeps us up at night. Um, Council member Cohen, did you have a, a question about that specifically? Yeah, I did. <laughs> you, you raised some good points in that question. Um, and, uh, and in addition to just benchmarking the, the magnitude, benchmarking the preventive maintenance plans of other cities might be helpful. Yeah, um, good point. You know, one, one thing, and I was gonna say one thing governments are bad at, but I think one thing everyone is bad at, including homeowners and everybody else, is doing the preventive maintenance that helps us so that we, we don't spend a lot when things break. We always wait till the catastrophe. Um, and so we're not alone in doing that. But when you said a million dollars is our, is our preventive maintenance, that just shocked me actually that we would have such a small number. I mean, I know that, you know, we have limited resources, but we're always penny wise and pound foolish and things like this. And so just finding out how do other cities do this? What kind of magnitude is set aside for it? And even an analysis of how does that, would that spending, an increase in that spending um, prevent future increases in backlog numbers, um, I think would be helpful. And then that could be a helpful thing to guide us through future budget process. Thank so you, Councilors. Oh, yeah, Matt Kano, Director of Public Works. I uh, just want to weigh in. I've been listening the whole time, but just got promoted. Um, yeah, we're, we'll definitely, we have a benchmarking group that of large California cities that we're part of for Public Works. And we ask questions of each other all the time. And so we'll definitely um, ask these questions and see what data they have. Um, and if there's anything good that we have to share, we'll definitely share that with, with the council offices and then incorporate that into our future planning. Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, to the, to the point about, uh, you know, kind of preventative maintenance, helping with, uh, preventing a backlog later, the explain to me again, and Walter, you can, I, I know you've done this before and I, I always forget because this is only a once a year report when we're talking about annual ongoing unfunded needs, when we, I say when, because I know we don't fund them. When we don't fund them, that adds to the backlog the following year, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, and when we do, does that help diminish the backlog over time, if we did? Uh, that is a moving target, Council Member Davis, because the more that we can do in any given year or any five year span, the other buildings are also aging an additional one to five years. So it, it is tough to say, well, if we do this, will the, the end line be reduced? Uh, that, that is very tough. It's almost, if you're working on a car and you do a tune-up one year, it's tough to say, well, you need another tune-up the next year or beyond or something else breaks. Uh, that's kind of the condition where we can attack what we know. If we're uh, successful in getting funding, uh, working on those improvements, uh, but as you're looking at the building as a whole and everything that is used to operate it efficiently, um, anything can give. And that's when we have the emergency requests at that point where maybe something gave earlier than it should have. Definitely doing the research, figuring out why it failed earlier. Uh, but that is an immediate need uh, that's needed at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it, it's tough to keep the, uh, uh, the cost estimates static. They, they consistently move as each year goes on too. Yeah. And as we acquire more square footage and more buildings, it just adds on. So it's, it's tough. Every building's age is different. The uh, improvements that are within the building can be done at different stages in its age as well too. Uh, then as the city acquires more properties and adds more square footage, the lump sum will, will be what it is, uh, unfortunately, each year as it goes. <laughs> okay, got it. Well, I, you know, and it, it depends on the asset too. There's, there's lots of different kinds of assets where not uh, funding that annual maintenance has a different impact. So like Walter said, it's, it can be difficult to, to give one clean answer because every asset has kind of a different uh, trajectory that we have to track. But when we're talking about streets, for example, Rick, when we don't do the ongoing maintenance like ceiling, we know that that actually ends up costing us more on the back end when, when we end up with a higher um, unfunded backlog, right? 
Yeah, there, there's two different numbers, like in particular for streets, there's the backlog and then there's the street condition. So like condition is more of a uh, outcome, you know, like what, what the streets look like, whereas the backlog is more of an input, you know, this is, this is the amount we think we need to get to a certain point. So uh, I think there is a closer correlation to uh, the condition, you know, if we don't do the maintenance that we need to do, there's a closer correlation there. Um, the backlog, just because we have a large maintenance backlog does not mean that our roads are in bad shape, if that makes sense. Um, and then I just wanted to ask one question about general fund versus the special and capital funds. The the difference is very large, and obviously we have sort of less control over the special funds and the capital funds. I don't know who wants to take this question, but um, how would we even, I, I guess I don't understand just off the top of my head, how we would go about addressing the the backlog within the special and capital funds areas. How do we raise that money? Is it is the only way we raise that money through a ballot measure? Um, this is Matt Kano. I'll, I'll take a first cut at that. Um, and it would it's I don't want to say it depends and then stop talking, but it, it does depend in a way on that special fund. For example, there are certain special funds that are um, tax based, and so we could increase that specific tax, um, whether it's a local, whether it's a downtown hotel-based tax or whether it's a um, um, conveyance fee, um, such as the construction and conveyance tax, we could increase or change that tax. A lot of that, that would require going to the voters. Um, we'd probably have to look one by one at each special fund. Uh, however, I would imagine most of them would need to go to the voters to change kind of how much we're collecting from that, that tax um, or, or whatever that special fund is coming from. Um, so unfortunately, it'd be kind of be a one by one analysis, which I'll stop talking for a minute. I don't know if I answered your question. Or not. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I guess I just I looked at, um, you know, the the technology and there's a general fund component to that. And then there's a technology component that's in the special and capital funds. And I'm assuming that's department based. I'm guessing that's department based. So I was kind of wondering, like, for each of these lines, it's not like there's one fund for each of these lines. So the technology line in the special and capital funds would be some DOT funds, some public works funds, right? Where we're talking about infrastructure capital funds. That yes. Would go it, this. Yeah, and I don't I don't know the technology one off the top of my head specifically, but the construction and conveyance tax is, is a really great example of it's 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 a if it, to change it, there's been a determination a while back that we would have to go to the voters. That special fund actually goes to parks, fire, library, um, and a few other departments um, that comes from the city's annual construction and conveyance tax. And so that's that again, that is one special fund that kind of gets spread out to multiple different departments. And even that spread by department may need to go to the voters to, to change um, over time. And, and we could follow up, I'll follow up specifically on that technology one to, to see what that source is and what it would take to change that just to make sure okay. you have a clear answer. Yeah, I'm thinking it's multiple sources for that one. And there may be others on that list that have multiple sources, um, like building facilities obviously would, would have multiple sources. Um, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a quick question in regards to the um, convention center. So you mentioned an evaluation of phased rehabilitation uh, needed for, um, I'm sorry, not the convention center, CPA, Center for Performing Arts, um, that the rehabilitation needed for the CPA is under development now. It, it sounds like that is um, phase rehab of the current CPA and looking at the dollar amount, obviously it's pretty significant, 42 million um, backlog. Can you describe a little bit more? I know uh, Council Member Foley was talking about it too just on you know, the, the end of life of that building and certainly obviously uh, being a historic building. So there's some other factors there, but I'm just kind of curious what, what that looks like, what that uh, extended um, evaluation looks like. Yes, Councilman Prowlis, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it was uh, a couple of meetings ago, you inquired specifically about the CPA as well. Uh, and the question of um, whether we you know, should consider maybe a, a redo for that facility uh, based on the extensive needs. And at that point, I think it was much I shouldn't say much less, but uh, considerably less than the 42 and a half million that we're seeing now. Um, so with that, um, we are looking at the different building systems. 
Uh, this could include also the user experience on the inside of the theater seating as well. Uh, but more specifically, uh, currently looking at the mechanical system in particular, and that's one big chunk again, about seven, seven and a half million uh, compared to the 42 and a half million um, uh, for that facility. For specific projects, we can get you that, that clear detail. Um, I, I don't have those details off the top of uh, uh, my list, uh, but uh, we, we do have uh, our team members that have gone through and have estimated that current amount. Uh, we can get that project list to you as well. Okay, for instance, the um, 7.1 million um, that's under consideration right now, that, that I guess that's for the chiller, boiler, cooling tower. What would an investment like that, help? I mean, is that a, like a 10 or 15 year investment for a, you know, that, that type of um, equipment? For mechanical systems, such as the chillers and the boilers, you can look at it anywhere from uh, per se a, a 20 to 30 year estimated timeline. Uh, depending on use, depending on uh, what type of system and the size as well. Um, so this is something we're also looking at the chiller system. And in particular, if we were to move this more to an all electric system, that is where our engineering team was asked, um, you know, th there's a boiler system tied to this uh, chiller replacement as well too, uh, where if we're no longer looking at the natural gas uh, utility and moving things towards electric, uh, we're building in that conversion cost as well, too, to go at an all-electric system, uh, which we put in a buffer uh, as it's unknown until it goes out to bid, uh, what that might actually cost uh, on the open market. Um, but, but that is something that we are looking at new, new technologies, but also keeping in line with the newer city policies as we're trying to achieve zero net carbon, um, um, uh, things of that nature. Uh, moving towards an all electric, at least for that particular project specific, uh, that's that's how we came up with that cost estimate. And lastly, ha have we done an evaluation of the building to even determine, like, hey, it, does this building have the bones to allow us to invest and upgrade in it, um, so that that way we could, you know, maintain this building for another thirty years, but in a manner that we want, uh, similar to what you're talking about now, right, with the right type of of infrastructure in it. Have we done that? Do we know that this building would 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 hold up for that purposes? Like kind of in sense, in essence, we could we could gut it right, and we could keep the 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 bones of it. Yes, the structural integrity is key, and you're right. You cannot build upon something that might be in a weakened state, uh, where it doesn't make sense to build up upon that uh, at this point. Uh, I will follow back with our team to see if that structural integrity assessment was done, and whether a rehab of existing is even possible, uh, based on what they have found. Okay, and it's just, that's just obviously I, I do actually really like the building itself, and um, I like the, the design all that, but I recognize it is extremely outdated, right? I mean, it was a, a pain within my first few years to try and ensure that we had enough uh, ADA accessible seating, and um, and that was I know the hard part was just how, how do you you know how do you build that in because uh, it wasn't ever thought of right it, it, at initially when it's built, so you're you're trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole, right? And and um, and you're, you're trying to keep the integrity of a, of a, of a building, right, uh, that you want to keep with it the same look and historic uh, nature. And so it's just very, very, very challenging. And then, as it looks like, right, some of these investments are going to be extremely costly, and they're going to be investments, I was thinking 10, 15, but you're saying maybe even 30 plus year type investments. And in my mind, why do that if the building itself isn't going to be the building we're going to keep for the next 30 years, right? And so uh, I just think we should really have that understanding before we lay out a plan to to you know keep the, the wheels running there um and then and then make some tough decisions right for for what that looks like uh make the proper investments you know to to keep keep things together but maybe have a plan set up that that tells us what the future is going to look like 30 years from now that was it thanks thanks yeah, Walter. thank you thank you all right um Seeing no more hands from my colleagues, I would like a motion to accept this report. Move to accept. Second. And this, I just noticed on the um, the motion to accept, does that also include to accept that this report will be presented every other year so that the next report occurs in 2024 instead of 2023? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all right with the seconder, Council Member Cohen? Uh, yeah, that's okay. Okay, thank you. Can we get a roll call, please? Foley? Aye. Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you.
Thank you. All right, we'll move to item two, move San Jose citywide and supportive policies report. John, do you wanna kick us yeah, off? Thank, thank you, Chair. John Risto, Director of Transportation. And this was deferred from a previous uh, meeting, so we're really glad we get a chance to talk about this. The uh, move San Jose plan used to be called access and mobility plan. I think we like the move San Jose name better. What, what that is in terms of what we're gonna use this for is really a strategic plan to outline how we're going to actually address many of the really progressive mobility goals that are embedded in many documents, including the general plan, climate smart, and a number of others. So we're going to talk about some of the policies that we're thinking about today. This will come to council in the future, but right now we're just going to give a status report. With me today is uh, Ramses Madhu, division manager in DOT, along with Augustine Cuello and Nick Fry that are going to be presenting this today. So, Ramses, if you're ready to go. Thank you, John. Uh, Ramses Madhu, Division Manager of Planning, Policy, and Sustainability in DOT, and I will be running through the presentation here. Get it up on screen. Put it in the right mode here. There we go. Come on. There we go. All right. All right. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Um, Chair and members of the committee. I'm pretty excited to be uh, coming near the end of the MOVE San Jose plan. Um, this is, I think, the fourth time we've come to the committee to discuss this plan. Um, and so now we really get to talk about kind of where is this going. Um, we're also going to be just mentioning two of the other supportive policies that are uh, working their way through the system. Um, and that's the uh, transit first policy, um, as well as the update to the council policy 5-1, otherwise known as the VMT policy. Um, Augustine uh, and Nick uh, from my team are here to answer questions on those two policies. They've been leading that development, uh, but to try and keep the presentation short, I'll be uh, doing the presentation myself. Okay, so this year um, is really a big year for DOT in terms of figuring out where we're going. What are we doing next? How do we take the guiding policies that we have in the city, the general plan, climate smart, um, and really turn them into the strategies and actions we need to take on. Move San Jose is really the umbrella policy or the umbrella plan, as John was just saying, it's the strategic plan. This is the plan that helps us really say, what are we prioritizing uh, with our resources? How are we focusing on the right residents? Um, and, and we've done a lot of work to try and get our uh, uh, decision-making process around that to be as data-driven as possible um, while incorporating as the best public input we can in that process. Um, underneath Move San Jose, we have a lot of other plans going on. Um, one you'll see actually tomorrow uh, at council, at full council, is the Emerging Mobility Action Plan. Um, and that's a very narrow plan that really looks at what are we going to do uh, with these new technologies that are coming to market and how to make sure that they serve the most, the best, uh, 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 serve our city the best way possible. Um, and of course, we have the bike plan as another, uh, what we call a modal plan. Other plans that we have out there are Movimento in East San Jose, uh, downtown plan, which is in progress. And we have some other, uh, the West San Jose is an, uh, plan is another one in progress. Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you guys a picture of how this all fits together. Um, and uh, some of the upcoming uh, pieces that you'll be considering, as well as what Move San Jose itself is. Okay, um, you guys have seen various versions of this slide um, over the last two years. Um, these are the nine uh, goals um, that we've set out um, to uh, try to address with, with Move San Jose. And in effect, these are becoming DOT's uh, goals, right? This is what we're trying to address. Uh, we uh, developed these goals um, uh, with um, a lot of input from the public through some workshops and the public and, and have brought them to you uh, for consideration uh, actually twice now. Um, so I won't belabor them in the spirit of making things fast. So where do we go from there, right? Um, how did we get to actually having a proposal from those, from those goals? All right, so this was our development process here, right? We, we set out those goals. Um, and then we started really looking at how are we gonna track progress on them? Um, and that was an initial set of key performance indicators um, uh, that kind of became the thread that kind of runs through all of uh, the rest of the work. We spent a lot of time looking at what are the different strategies out there in the world 
uh, or in people's minds in our city um, or in the region? Um, uh, what, what are the different ways that people approach uh, trying to meet those nine goals? And we actually ended up with a list of around 400 different strategies uh, some from uh, public members here in the city, city of San Jose, some from BTA or MTC, um, and many from cities uh, around the country and the world. We then took that large list of strategies and started to refine which ones really make sense for us, right? Which ones meet uh, what folks in the public here in San Jose want to see done and how, uh, and how effective are they in reaching the goals that we're, we're uh, working at. Um, we then really took those KPIs that I was talking about earlier and refined them even more so they really are uh, as specific uh, to the different neighborhoods within our city or districts uh, within our city council districts um, to really understand how um, uh, those become a community-based metric system. Um, then using those metrics, uh, the, the KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, uh, we then uh, 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 built a new uh, way of modeling how these things work. It's called the decision support system. Um, and this really helped us estimate the outcome um, of what the different actions um, uh, will be. Uh, how, how will they actually affect our city and which one should we be strategizing? Um, and so in the end, we end up with a package um, that is uh, put together from this, uh, basically a national perspective through our local uh, uh, community-based uh, engagement process, all run through uh, this key performance indicator system to help us get to uh, a recommendation. All right. Um, these, uh, just kind of talking a little bit about the outreach process, um, as many of you probably remember, we've been very fortunate to be able to bring on board uh, four community-based organizations um, who have helped us reach out into communities that we just wouldn't have been able to otherwise um, with the, the connections they have and the insight they have to be able to do that. Um, together, uh, we've hosted um, over seven uh, workshops, many of them in Spanish and Vietnamese, um, to make sure that we're doing a, uh, the best job we possibly can um, uh, with outreach. Um, the community feedback for this slide is actually just a little bit old. Uh, this is still the presentation I was supposed to give a month ago. We've done two more public workshops since then, um, and our overall number is more around 1,500 or so. Um, but we've been very successful in, in reaching a, a, a lot of people in San Jose to discuss this plan, um, and, and we've been very proud of, of that. And you'll notice throughout the presentation um, uh, the, these faces here on the side with quotes. We did do, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call them, focus groups and persona building, right? So this is, uh, we sat down with some people uh, from our city and really got into the issues with them, interviewing them for over an hour. And in the personas development, um, we then actually followed them around for a whole day and really took notes on, okay, how is transportation part of your life? What are the different aspects of it that um, uh, that affect your ability to get around or just live your life, right? And get your kids to school or, or go, you know, go shopping or whatever it is. And so you'll see these quotes throughout the presentation from those processes of kind of highlighting various aspects of, of what we're trying to get done. All right, so what did we hear in, um, in our uh, outreach? One, we heard that folks really do want to see us have these other transportation modes, right? Everybody, you know, the, the majority, the, the vast majority of trips in San Jose are still taken by automobile. But that doesn't mean that's exactly where people want to be. And so what we're hearing is folks, uh, uh, particularly actually in, in the disadvantaged communities, um, really want to see transit be a real option for them, uh, for biking to be a real option for them. But they don't feel like those options are yet timely, reliable, safe, or affordable um, to fit into their lives. Um, and so that, that's kind of a big call to action for us um, and part of why you'll see in the, uh, in the final recommendation here um, that transit really be the major focus or one of the major focuses that we, we take on. Um, we heard that folks really want to be incentivized um, uh, and, and they want to see us, uh, again, increase access to these different modes. Um, we had some very good conversations, very eye-opening conversations uh, with, with the people with disabilities community um, about how to best incorporate uh, uh, their needs into this level of thinking. 
and we actually just had a, um, a, a workshop with that community uh, co-hosted by uh, Council Member Foley just last week, um, which was, uh, I thought, a, quite a, a successful event in terms of really bringing in um, some, some great voices and, and, and teaching us how to, to make things that much better. Um, and we also really saw um, that the story of transportation fits in, as you all know, into the larger story and problems of the city, right? Housing crisis, homelessness, um, uh, and, and equity really are things that are not you know, on the fringes, but are center to us being able to be successful in transportation. All right, so what does the actual um, proposal of this look like? I'm moving right into what this is. So what we did is we took those 400 different strategies we originally had and we boiled them down to 26. These are just some examples of them, but we did break them into three different uh, categories, with streets, transit, programs, and policy. Um, streets is kind of what we think about as generally for DOT, right? This is our design. This is our use of space. This is our programming of the streets, right? Um, what are we going to, what materials are we going to use? Uh, uh, how are we going to bring in uh, green infrastructure and shading? How are we going to make more and more streets um, um, feel very comfortable for folks walking or using wheelchairs to get around on? Things like that. Um, and this, uh, you know, Vision Zero kind of fits into this pocket, the bike plan fits into this pocket, um, uh, all the complete streets uh, pieces that we've been working on fit into this. The second one is transit, and I think this is a really important piece that we're trying to elevate um, uh, uh, within the city processes. While VTA runs transit, we control almost all of the environment they work within. It is our streets, our geometry, our signals and our sidewalks that they interface with. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done um, to, to help transit perform better in, uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, and so we're really elevating transit as uh, one of the three core areas that we think we should be focusing on. Um, and here are some of the, the, the examples there, right? So transit expansion, uh, we're working on, on things like the uh, airport connector, things like that to kind of really flesh that out. Um, spending a lot of time on, on how do we improve existing transit services, what can we do, um, and things like that. And the third major category is policies and programs. Um, this is um, a large swath of uh, uh, yeah, policies and programs that we could take on as the city to help progress these goals. Uh, one of the major ones is the transit first policy um, as uh, requested by council. Uh, back just before the pandemic uh, to try and get that. And we'll actually be discussing that a little bit today um, and hopefully having that move forward with the Move San Jose plan itself when it goes to council. Um, some other ones we're looking at are, are there ways for us to bring together uh, what's happening in development uh, with buildings um, and bring together um, instead of kind of the somewhat black box or somewhat, I wouldn't say black box, not the right word, but, but there's a level of uncertainty in development um, uh, and I, by this, I mean commercial and, and housing development um, around what comes out of the transportation piece of that. Um, and we want to see if we can streamline that and at the same time move that money um, into more um, uh, most effective projects possible. So that's transportation impact fee. Um, and there's more. And of course, you can uh, search through the plan itself to see the full list of 26. Um, so that's that larger big picture of what are all the strategies um, that we uh, have brought into the city to, to address um, uh, the, um, the major issues. Now, how are we looking at those in the specific uh, uh, districts? You know, not each district's the same. Um, within each district, it can be quite different, um, but we did uh, at first move to a district geography. Um, so we went through um, and looked at um, what what each district needs, right? And, and so the different ways we did that um, were first just really taking an overall look at the district um, and some of the unique characteristics that uh, kind of make each district unique. Um, and then looked at the equity uh, frameworks and really tried to figure out where are the communities that have not gotten investment from the transportation pieces in the past, or at least not in the uh, equitable way, um, and started figuring out where we can uh, kind of push towards that. Um, and we looked at the key performance indicators um, and scores and tried to figure out where uh, there are lackings in the different districts and where they might um, um, best um, 
where investment would pay off the most in each one. And then we looked at the planned projects um, and tried to figure out where there are gaps or just where there are actually planned projects we should be uh, starting to, to push forward. Um, right. Um, and then strategies and actions really is, is uh, what are we going to try and do with each one? So what does this look like? So here's District 3 as an example. Um, and you can see uh, towards the top is the direction we want these key performance indicators to move. Um, the city average is there in the middle. All of the scores have been normalized um, to make them uh, at least somewhat legible. Um, and you can see here the nine goals across the bottom. Um, and you can see in District 3, there's some things that are doing very well, like move, uh, move the economy, right? We're seeing jobs uh, uh, in downtown. We're seeing more jobs coming in downtown. Um, we're seeing things like uh, connected neighborhoods. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, connected neighborhoods in the 15-minute neighborhood. This means that they're walkable. This means that you can you can go get your groceries, or you can go get your um, uh, coffee uh, close by um, home. These things are doing pretty well downtown. But you can see that some of these other elements, um, uh, such as transportation safety um, or less driving, um, aren't doing as well. And so that's the kinds of areas we'd want to focus on in this district. All right, you kind of see the highlight there. Um, so what that leads us to is uh, some of the strategies then that um, uh, stand out for this district. And each district has its own analysis that again, you can look up at the, on the project website to, to pull into or dig into, right? And so for D3 here, these are the kinds of uh, pieces that we'd want to dig into to help us move those needles um, in the right direction. And of course, we have the downtown transportation plan, um, which is uh, already kind of assuming this overall framework within its work, um, make sure we're all aligned. Now, um, looking at the big picture, right? So that's the, the district level picture. Now doing that analysis across the city. Um, our goal here is at the bottom, right? Now this, this is a kind of, how do we meet our goals through these different things? Um, and we put together uh, a, a few different scenarios and said, all right, well, if we do all of these things, how close do we get to our goal by 2040? And what we're seeing is that um, while there's a lot we can do by really getting folks onto bikes, make transit that much more appealing, um, uh, prioritizing and investing in um, the, the equity priority areas, um, and uh, those different policies and programs we talked about, we can move the needle quite about a lot if we can get the resources and focus on them. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that's external um, to uh, what we have control over that would, would really be needed to get us all the way to our goal. And that's things like supportive land use, really making sure we're focusing on um, uh, urban villages and density and stuff like that, which fortunately our general plan does quite well, um, as well as electrification of transportation in general. Um, to cultural change, and then a lot of stuff at the state and federal level. All right, so that's the Move San Jose plan presentation. I'm going to move into the two supporting policies now um, and do them quickly. So the first one is uh, Council Policy 5-1. Um, this is our transportation analysis policy, and it, and it um, works uh, to uh, define how staff or the city looks at new incoming land use projects and how they relate to um, uh, uh, transportation. Of course, you'll remember uh, uh, back in 2018, we uh, changed the system as, as per state law um, to move from what was called level of service, um, which basically looked at the impact of more automobiles at a particular intersection uh, to uh, a much broader and environmentally aligned metric called vehicle miles traveled, um, which looks at how many miles of vehicle travel are related to new projects. Um, and when we got uh, this um, uh, policy passed back in 2018, we were only the fourth city in the state to do so. Um, and uh, so uh, we uh, did uh, get direction to come back after a few years, once we learned a little bit uh, to come with some updates um, per lessons learned um, and we're kind of happy to do so. Um, so uh, we also got some direction when we reported our overall strategy um, uh, to um, the community service area, the uh, Community Economic Development uh, Committee um, a little while back. Um, we were given direction um, to find ways to give a council more discretion on, um, uh, on 
making decisions around uh, around projects um, that have um, 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 substantial uh, impacts. Sorry, the word is escaping me right there. Um, as well as how to promote more affordable housing. Um, and then there's a little bit of technical stuff we've been working on. So um, one, uh, to promote more general housing um, uh, or market rate housing, um, we are uh, recommending opening up the um, policy uh, override mechanism. So this is when uh, policies have significant and unavoidable impacts. That's the phrase I was looking for. Um, uh, before uh, housing projects um, uh, outside of urban villages uh, did not have access to that policy. Um, they basically had no path forward through this, this policy. So uh, we're, amend we're proposing to amend that. Um, so uh, any land use project that is um, uh, 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 consistent with the general plan would have access to that mechanism, um, giving council more discretion uh, to take on those actions. Um, we are also looking to further promote affordable housing you can see here on these maps right now, uh, the current map um, are the areas of the city where affordable housing um, has a streamlined approach to CEQA, meaning they don't have to do CEQA analysis for transportation um, uh, if they're in these areas. The proposal, um, as you can see, would significantly change the geography around uh, where those types of projects would, would get a leg up. Um, and then the last one is, um, uh, Santa Clara County uh, through VT, well, VTA, I should say, um, took the uh, um, VMT calculation and systems that we built uh, when we came forward with our policy um, and we kind of uh, uh, cut the weeds, not only actually for our area, but actually the whole state. There's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, jurisdictions following our work. And they um, uh, basically developed that into a countywide system. Um, we're going to be moving over to their system now. The the number the question we keep get asking is that change the numbers and, and no, it doesn't change the numbers because those we we use the same transportation model um, that informs uh, them. Very quick uh, last piece here is the transit first policy. We're very excited um, to be uh, bringing this forward. Um, transit first policy uh, will um, uh, be the policy as well as some of the tools that the city staff will use uh, to progress, um, take responsibility, I should say, for our element of, of making transit uh, successful. Of course, the policy, and this is broken up into three different parts. One is the policy itself, um, uh, and that really states, you know, hey, wh where do we prioritize and why do we prioritize transit um, and give us a, comp you know, a clear statement from uh, from council as to where staff should be making hard decisions, right? Because a lot of this is, you know, at this corner, we can make transit go faster or slower or automobiles or something else. Um, and that decision kind of gets made in a, uh, you know, by, by whatever direction we're given at that moment. And so this should help us make more decisions towards making transit work better. Um, we've developed an internal toolkit. Um, and this is a lot of, of best practices and things like that for staff to, to take on. Um, as we're thinking through uh, road design and, and, and development. And the last one is, is the network pieces. And this is where we're looking at general plan um, designations uh, for roadways um, and how that relates back to VTA routes um, and making sure that the general plan designations uh, align well with making sure service works well. Why does that matter? Because those general plan designations are what trigger uh, um, basically the policy, right? If things are in a general, in a uh, grand boulevard, for example, that means we would um, give more priority to transit over other modes. Um, and so we're doing some work to make sure that those, uh, those networks are aligned. Um, and so here you can see kind of different pictures of, of what that looks like. All right. Uh, well, thank you for listening to my blitz there. Um, I'll take questions. Thank you, Ramses. We're going to go to the public first. We've got a few hands up. Uh, the first hand, before we go to uh, public comment, though, I do want to reiterate our code of conduct. Remember that public speakers are not to engage in conversation with the chair council members or staff, and that all committee members, staff, and the public are to refrain from abusive language. 
failure to comply with this code of conduct and a disturbing or disrupting or impeding the orderly conduct of this meeting will result in removal from this meeting. So I just wanna be clear about that. And now uh, we'll go to the public. And that is uh, the first speaker is calling user one. Hey, thank, thanks for the lecture. I really, I really appreciate it. You know, I mean, uh, did your third grade teacher call you and uh, want a classroom rules back? Give me a break. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Um, you know, it's been my, uh, my feeling, you know, I, I, I'm really trying to learn a perspective of how to address our, our, our community and city government issues in terms of low income, racial equity, and civil protections ideas. So um, I, when you lose that lens and that framework, I think it just naturally develops a more interesting way to, uh, a more helpful way, a more organized way to, to, to address our issues as a city. And so I, I have concerns about uh, a bit about the streamlining process you're talking about for the future of the uh, housing issues and what the city council can be more, can be given a better flexibility about. I, I just wanna question that here. I hope that can be a more open discussion in the future and, and good luck to that. Um, I also am, uh, it, this, 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 these plans had uh, re the really good intentions of what Vision Zero is really meant to be. And that was nice to hear. And when I, I always try to include, I feel, you know, each individual city is working on ideas of what can be openness and accountability with the future of their technology. When each city learns to do that in their own good ideas and pace, that's developing, that's part of the future of sustainability and accountability that really has to be, I think it has an awesome place in our future that really helps define community participation in the future of, of this sort of decision-making and organization and uh, just this process. So thanks for this item and uh, good luck in, in how we can have an open conversation about it. And with uh, mixed income ideas, always invite mixed income and this idea of flexibility to this sort of dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Avery. But before you start, Avery, I need to check in with the clerk to make sure that the timer is working. Okay. Okay. Sorry, it froze. We're just trying to get a new timer up. Okay, I'll use my, um, Avery, I hope you don't mind. I'll use my phone. Go ahead, Avery. Okay, I just uh, I just was curious about the relationship and coordination with BTA. I'm really glad to see the transit priority, and I'm wondering if something like a uh, priority for the for light rail going through downtown is something on the plan, or is there something stopping that from happening? Because I would love to see light rail get ever so slightly faster through downtown because it is quite painful through there. But... Thank you, Avery. That's it for members of the public. We'll go to my colleagues, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, staff, for the uh, report and the update. Appreciate the work uh, that we're doing here in, in this regard and certainly making San Jose much more multimodal and, and planning for that. Uh, I'd echo the comments from our last speaker, as I think we all would. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see uh, light rail speed up through downtown. Um, and there are efforts uh, through VTA um, and, and hoping to do that. But this, I think more broadly, obviously with, with what we can do in, in planning out the, the city infrastructure is, um, is important as well and, and, and under our purview. And so appreciate that. Uh, specifically, my comments are in relation to council policy 5-1. And uh, thank you staff for going and taking a look back. Uh, I had asked for a little uh, more leeway as we look at the opportunity for housing development uh, and really ultimately not necessarily opening up the floodgates, but giving councils some discretion when uh, there are particular cases of where we may feel uh, there's an overriding consideration. We, we do this 
time to time, uh, and certainly when it comes to, for instance, environmental impacts, um, historical impacts. And in this regard, I think we, we should have some similar opportunities for uh, our BMT goals and, um, and then being able to, to, to weigh that out amongst the other goals that we have, namely the need for, for more housing. And so looking at where we've started and where we're at now, I think we're moving in the right direction as far as opening up uh, opportunities to where there can be an overriding consideration from, um, from the council. And looking at the, the policy language itself, the only feedback I'm hearing, and, and I do agree with it from some within our, our housing development community, uh, is the restrictions with urban villages. And, and this is uh, under um, the, uh, the, the, the amended language here um, for 5-1 in, in section uh, 3B and uh, looking at market rate housing located within urban villages. Um, and, and obviously there's a, a number of other requirements that we're looking at. But when we look at the urban villages, uh, I, well, number one, I, I think those were developed quite some time ago now. And when you look out ahead, I think that there are likely other development or develop areas where we could develop, I should say, throughout the city that we may be interested in expanding to, or at least want to, to, to consider for potential growth of housing that may not have been planned within an urban village. And I think that this might, it might restrict it too tight. And I do recognize there is an interest to sort of just open it up and, 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 and have it be where the council has some discretion over any project. I would, I would default to that myself, like we do in, in some other areas, again, like with environmental concerns. But I recognize that in doing that, uh, it does, in essence, open up the floodgates for projects to be considered anywhere in the city and then kind of negates what we're trying to put here with a focus on our VMT goals. So I, I'd like to land somewhere in between that uh, where where we are are giving an opportunity for the council to weigh in on some considerations, overriding considerations that that fits with what you've prescribed here, but but goes a little bit beyond just the urban villages that we that we've currently uh, agreed upon on the council. So I'd like to hear some feedback from from the staff on that, and maybe what some of your thoughts are. And I recognize here it's, it's hypothetical, and there I don't know if there is another. You know, category that we could be including. I know urban villages, right, is a pre-existing one, and and so that might have made sense for staff. But I, I do think it is a bit restrictive. So ha happy to hear some feedback from from staff on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the great thoughts and and um, uh, and, and insight and yeah, questions. So uh, to make clear what we're proposing, we are proposing to open up uh, the the ability for to take on. Uh, considered considering overriding considerations for uh, projects anywhere in the city. So if the general plan says you can develop a project uh, for land use reasons um, anywhere in the city, um, then this policy does not stand in the way. Um, we have opened up that channel uh, for council to say, all right, in this circumstance, we are okay uh, with taking on uh, this project if it lives up to the considerations. Right? Now, we have given guidelines as to what those considerations are, right? There is a, a specific fee um, that's associated with the amount of vehicle miles traveled not mitigated by the project, right? So that's, and that's that same mechanism that's been there since, since we uh, passed the policy in 2018. But we have, to make sure, every, to make it really clear, we have opened up that mechanism to anywhere in the city at this point for residential projects that was already open to, to commercial projects. Does that speak to what you're saying, Council Member Perales, or is there a further refinement that you're looking for us to, to, um, to consider? Yeah, it would be a further refinement. I think what you're talking about is looking at something anywhere in the city, but under the, the, the context that it fits within the, the, the general plan, the, uh, what I'm reading here that uh, I guess for it's it's item three. I'm sorry in the in the council policy five dash one that the suggested the project is either 100% affordable, right, residential, or uh, project constructs or 
funds multimodal transportation improvements is detailed in appendix b is and then it's market rate housing located in urban villages and that's where the market rate housing um comes into play so maybe you can you can describe to me how yeah. those two are the same or how they're different from what you were describing there yeah so it's a little bit different than what you're understanding right so we again we are allowing any market rate housing project anywhere in the city to use the mechanism that we're proposing and they're not it's not restricted to urban villages anymore um, in our proposal i apologize if our memo is is not clear enough on that just yeah, I was I was just going to say it, it does sound we can get you the potentially revised language because it sounds like you are looking at that current language and it is a change as Ramses uh, described to change and say if you're allowed to do housing for the general plan, then you are allowed to move forward if the council decides that a statement of overriding consideration is appropriate in this case. So it, it is a change from that that currently authored policy. Ah, okay, so so what I'm reading, what you guys have now is is updated from that. It, it's it's going to be proposed to you to be updated from that. Exactly correct. Oh, well, that might solve my problem. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and if that's the case, then then uh, then I might not have any other uh, questions or concerns on it. But I, I I guess I'll wait until I take a read and look at that. But it sounds like that that is uh, going to address what what I was what I was asking about. Yeah, and we and we can of course can come give you a, a briefing on on the details anytime you like, um, and there'll be a uh, longer form memo coming out for uh, planning commission. Um, actually, maybe tonight it might be posted if everything went through well uh, at the administration side. So, um, and you'll see it more spelled out even there. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and then just lastly, um, in regards to the. I know you put it within the, the report and then on the slide is too that uh, the, the district three goals um, was spe you specifically used that as, as an example. Um, um, and I appreciate being able to, to see that. I imagine my, my colleagues will as well too for, for their districts, but I, I, I think it was really helpful just to kind of look and see where we're doing well. Um, and then, you know, areas that we, we can improve on. Um, the, the less driving one to me really uh you know, kind of calls out to to a downtown core you would you would hope that that, that would be a pretty high bar are uh, do you already have the analysis for the rest of the districts or no not yet yeah 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 it's all already in there in the plan um and the reason why you would see uh drive less lower uh not as as high as we want is is that we actually have a background uh goals map right that says in each neighborhood to for us to get to that mode shift mode shift um uh, we need certain neighborhoods to do a lot more of the shifting. And obviously downtown is the place where we need the most shifting to happen, right? And so uh, the fact that down, you know, downtown is, is below the mark um, has to do with the fact that it actually has to carry more of the weight um, uh, uh, within the whole system of the city to, to, for us to get to our goals. Uh, okay, so we may actually be doing as well as maybe I thought we were, but we need to do a much better because our goals are, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that makes that's sense. Right. I mean, that's, that's right, that's right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look at absolute percentages, downtown is obviously better than okay. lots of other areas in the city, uh, okay. but uh, it's it's the goal it needs to hit is, is a lot higher. All right, because I know Jessica's riding her bike and I'm like, that has got to count <laughs> as a positive to, to mark for us. So, and I, I don't want that to be, I don't want her to think she's hurting that goal, right? She's, she's helping it, we're all helping. Okay, now I get it, thank you. That, that is helpful. I, that does make sense. And I, I would expect it as well, right? That was the thought was that in downtown, you know, you would hope that you got a lot more people that are driving less. I know, I know significantly of a number of people that are moving into the new development, specifically the Miro Towers across the street. I've been able to meet some of the new residents and they don't have cars. And that's terrific to hear, right? I mean, that's exactly what we wanted to hear. We're, we're still several years away from BART being, you know, outside for them. Um, but I can tell you, they were already excited about that, right? A lot of them looked at the city for that. And it's just great to, to see new residents moving into the downtown core uh, and not having vehicles themselves. And so, um, you know, excited for that. So uh, that'll, that'll do it for me. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councilmember Perales. And uh, I will call on you in a second, Councilmember Cohen. I just want to clarify something about Council Policy 5-1, the VMT policy. Those changes, if I remember correctly, the direction from Councilmember Perales when we voted on that was for was to come back to council. I, I would like to clarify, are you coming, will you come back to this committee 
with those proposed changes specifically, since we didn't see the draft before it comes to council, it would be really helpful, I think, for, for us to have input on that before it goes to council. Yeah, sure. If, if, if you'd like, uh, we can work with, with uh, Mr. Lloyd there uh, to get us on the agenda um, in a timely fashion. Yeah. Okay. So I would ask whoever makes the motion for this, this item to, to include that, that the specific changes proposed to 5 def come back to this committee. Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And actually, that was going to be one of my questions because I felt like there was still a little bit of uncertainty about what the policy is going to look like and it'd be good for the, the, the committee to weigh in before the council does. Um, I'm not sure if I understand enough to ask a smart question, but I'll try. Um, <laughs> but for, first of all, let me ask you a very simple, a, a simple question first. When we talk about transit corridors, we're including bus routes in addition to light rail, I, I think, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and so some of the properties out there for infill, potential infill development, some some of which are actually on sites that are designated as urban village sites, and some of which may not be. And, you know, hypothetically, we could have a, a piece of property, like a school that gets rezoned or something for, for residential. But I, some of those sites that I know of or that I'm thinking about are actually borderline on, on the map, which wasn't in your presentation, but I've seen that has the mitigate, mitig mitigable sites um, and similar almost red unmitigable, unmitig I, forget, I don't know how to say that word, but, no. um, <laughs> but um, so I'm, I'm curious as we, as some of those sites begin to get projects coming forward, I just want to understand better what the process would be and what developers would have to go through on sites like that, because I think there's, I've heard concern from some um, about what it would mean for, for the ability to move forward on, on certain projects, what uncertainty there would be, how much cost there would be for mitigation, or whether it's the city even deems them to be able to have options for mitigation. Uh, um, so that, that, I guess you understand my questions, maybe you can. Uh, absolutely, Council Member. And I think, you know, it has been, it, it's flown by, but it has been uh, four years since Council Policy 5 1 went into place. So it would probably make sense. Uh, to combine the request to, to come back with a reminder about the CEQA process and how it works with transportation and how these changes would, um, would affect particular you know, properties and, and the process that they would go through. So we can kind of line up more than two slides um, and the full kind of uh, proposed policy to come back to you with that information. Okay, because there are certain, you know, we often think of certain sites where we might not want to have to have uh, council weigh in on on um, making exceptions to a policy when sites are already zoned appropriately, but it seems like what we're aiming, what we're heading towards here is a, is the potential that the council would have to make exceptions for certain cases. Um, so I just want to understand that a little bit better right. as we move forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And parts of that just, you know, we, we can work with the, the CEQA team because parts of that are inherent to the, to the CEQA process to some extent. Um, but we can certainly bring back that full information and, you know, make sure everybody understands it uh, completely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation on Move San Jose and Ramses. Thanks. Thank you for putting together the town hall we did last Monday for mostly focusing on disabilities or we had people in the audience who had disabilities and were concerned about access and, and mobility. So I, I appreciate that. That was really very helpful. Uh, and one thing that came up there with there was, uh, is how our seniors are getting around, not uh, whether they have to go from, if they're homebound and go from one doctor's appointment to the other's doctor's appointment, there's a difficulty in, especially out in District 9, with a lack of buses and light rail isn't that convenient in most of my area. So will the transit first policy benefit that or how will we um, improve access for our seniors? Yeah, great question. So, so addressing it directly to the transit first policy. Yes, as much as transit can be improved in its current state. Right? And so 
Um, transit in San Jose uh, could gain uh, from things like Q-Jump lanes uh, and even more, uh, and we already do quite a bit of uh, signal priority, but there's more signal priority that can be done. Um, uh, for example, there's a, a really great pilot project to see if we can do what's called centralized signal priority, uh, where basically we use the system we have on the fire trucks, um, where fire trucks just get green no matter where they're going, um, because we know where their, their uh, GPS signal is, um, and we get a, a trace from that, and that goes back to our, our signal system. Um, looking at setting up something similar for the transit vehicles, it's pretty, it's expensive in itself, but less expensive than doing a whole bunch of, of individual intersections. Um, and things like bus only lanes, like we're starting to study on Santa Clara and things like that. And so the transit first policy really is going to help us as staff take on a higher priority for transit within the system. And that should increase the speed. And um, as, as our friends at, at VTA like to say, you know, uh, we have a huge budget hole. <laughs> and part of that has to do with cost of operations and buses going slow actually costs more money because to keep the amount of service on a route up means you have to add vehicles to service, meaning you have another driver to pay and another vehicle to maintain just to keep service up as before, right? And so um, if we can improve transit's operation on our streets, we are both adding to the, uh, the speed at which people are getting from one place to another or the time, the, the time it takes, as well as hopefully adding to that operations um, that's helping solve the operations puzzle. So that's right. Um, yeah. So what's the number one thing standing in your way from implementing transit first right now? Or, or are there, what's that? There, that's kind of a wish list, but what are the things we can do to help move transit first forward? I mean, I think one thing is, is we got to get this policy in front of you guys so you can you can tell us what you think of it and, and see if you want to adopt what we're proposing. Um, uh, but then two, it's 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 lining up funding, right? I mean, it really is. Um, we could put a policy in place, but getting it done. Um, Nick Frey here has been our, our main author and, and our cat herder on this project and doing an incredible job. Um, but we can say we're going to prioritize everything, but it's always going to take money, right? And it's making those choices when they actually do come up. Right? Um, are we going to take a lane for transit? Are we going to consider that for real? Um, are we going to allow uh, for certain automobile movements to slow down so that transit can move faster? Right? Th those are real choices that we have made. We kind of, how do you say, we, sometimes we say we've, we've killed the transit system, and it's not bad. We've, we've hurt the transit system through a thousand paper cuts. Right? Yeah. We've made minor decisions that don't seem very uh, effective or very big over many, many, many years, and they've stacked up against transit. And so we need to start pulling that decision-making process back the other way. It is a long-term process. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, and it's going to take us working with BTA to kind of really focus where we're going. Um, but if you're asking what you can do the most is, you know, consider the policy, um, help us make sure it's as good as it can be, um, and then follow up with decisions afterwards that continue to, to, to follow that line. I'll, I'll definitely consider the policy since it was something I brought as as priority setting session, I think three years ago or two years ago, I forget. But anyway, I, I really appreciate your moving forward with it. I think that's one of the things we need to do is speed up transit so that people consider it as an alternative to getting in their cars. If they if it takes longer to get on a bus to get where they want to go, they're not going to take that if they can't that that. Uh, opportunity if they can get in their car and drive. So we need to do everything we can to speed up transit in, in that way. And I see Rob raised his hands. Rob, do you want to weigh in here? Uh, just to clarify, uh, Chair and, and Council or Committee members, uh, and Jessica, uh, so we would need to shape for a May return in order to, for you to have the language uh, in time for council's review. Just want to make sure the timing is right on that. We, we've been planning for a mid-May review of council policy 5-1, which is what Rob is speaking to. So we can look to the, to the May or we would need to make the choice to, to push out the policy further. So we can eat great information, Rob. Thanks. Um, Thank we you. can do either of those. Jessica, do you think you'll be ready by May? Uh, uh, yes, in fact, so this policy originally um, went through the Planning Commission 
and the city council. And so that is the, the path and actually is going to planning commission in April. So we will definitely be ready by May. Uh, it does need to go to planning commission before city council um, as it affects the new development uh, world. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to move that we accept the report and that the uh, proposed revisions to 5-1 come back to this committee before they go to council. And Jessica, you mentioned something about CEQA, including that uh, in well, the motion. We, yeah, Does for input. Absolutely. We can do that coordination with the city CEQA team um, just to clarify the, the process because some of it is dictated by CEQA rather than by our city's policy. Okay, so include the, the CEQA component in the motion. And I so move. I'll second. And with that, I'm, I'm finished because everybody else was pretty much going in the same direction of their question, questioning that I was. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilmember Esparza. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a comment and that is as we look at moving people around equitably, one of the things and I've brought this up many times that we need to consider is um, some communities have a higher number of shift workers in them and um, not just in terms of like recognizing that transit is mass transit is just not realistic when you have to leave the house to go to work at 3 a.m., but in terms of the design. And so I just wanted to add that comment because, um, you know, some parts of the city are, are very different in that regard. And sometimes they drive, sometimes they get on a bicycle and uh, ride several miles, you know, to or from work at very um, late hours. And, <clears throat> and that's just a, a reality for a lot of folks. Yeah, thank you for those comments, and, and we absolutely hear, and that's you know part of the district level analysis we did. But yeah, I mean, I think the, the I say we're not trying to get everyone to do the same thing, right? We're trying Got it. To system yep. That, yep. Right? Yep. We're trying to get a system that allows for all people to exist and within the lives that they have, right? And right now we actually have a one size fits all system. It's everyone basically needs to drive, right? And so we're trying to open up that that the system to to more options. But yeah, yep. Uh, Had to much. say it though. Thank you. <laughs> Um, regarding the move San Jose plan and even the assumptions that are built into the BMT policy, when I, I feel like I have to say this because we're in Silicon Valley, when we're talking about future transportation modalities and companies, we get our offices get contacted regularly to, to tell us about these things. And we were one of the first cities to have a scooter policy, for example, and there are some um, different autonomous vehicles and little pods that are that are being worked on right now in in our area have we reached out to these companies are we surveying these companies and finding out kind of what their timelines are and how how our transportation goals and assumptions need to shift over time and and how do we incorporate that into the the draft plan and and our vmt policy Great question, and absolutely, yeah, th those are, you know, kind of, those are the fun questions in a certain way, right? So one thing I'll say is this, a car is a car, whether it's driven by a person or a robot, it takes up a certain amount of space. Um, now on a highway, you can make, because of speed and, and space, you can make them basically take up less space. They can drive closer together um, and they can create platooning kinds of effects. But when you have autonomous vehicles within cities, they don't help us with BMT, as is what the analysis is coming out to right now. And you can watch what's happening in San Francisco. Um, both Cruise and Waymo are uh, very close to launching commercial services. And the city is actually looking at banning AVs from certain parts of the city. Because what they're seeing is things like Uber and Lyft are in fact increasing the vehicle miles on the street. Um, because what they're doing is they're pulling people out of transit um, and they're actually inducing trips. Um, so I don't know if I completely agree with that analysis or if it's absolutely right for San Jose, we're not San Francisco. But what we're seeing is that AVs are 
very effective in helping us deal with safety and then very effective in helping us deal with access, folks who can't drive, folks who have trouble getting around. But do they help us with vehicle miles traveled? Do they help us uh, densify and, and reach our urban goals? Most likely not. Um, and and that, that's a tentative analysis, but that's what's starting to really come out from the folks who are, who are seeing those firsthand. Um, that being said, emerging mobility plan is going to council tomorrow. Um, and we will be, uh, we've set up through that process, that plan, um, really looking at how do we address the community's needs as these systems come out. Um, uh, and, and we haven't said exactly in that plan when, but when should we actually spend the time? Because uh, I've been in transportation planning for, for over 15 years now. Um, and since day one, ABs were supposedly around the corner. And we have spent an immense amount of time figuring out how ABs are going to shape transportation. And they're still not here. Now, it seems like they're around the corner, right? Because Cruise and Waymo are supposedly launching. Will they come to us? Who knows, right? And so really making sure we're spending the right amount of time on the right things is really important. And now we're really going to be presenting a, a process for how we would bring a system like that into the city and work with the public to, to make sure it's, it's um, helping all people and not just um, folks who, who live down here. Uh, one small addition to that, Jessica Zank, Deputy Director for DOT, is only that uh, there was an industry committee that helped with that Emerging Mobility Action Plan in addition to the Community Task Force. So I think that's one of the tactics that we are using to your, to your question, Councilmember Davis, Chair Davis, about um, you know, how are we making sure that we're trying to keep up and even look ahead. So how do we incorporate those um, emerging mobility plans into our move San Jose and our VMT over time. Like what's the, what's the process for, you know, making the left hand talk to the right hand. Yeah, absolutely. So, so one, that first graphic I started out with, right. These plans are kind of, uh, Russian dolls, right. Uh, um, I'm allowed to say Russian right now, but, um, uh, Russian dolls in terms of, of how they work. Right. And there's feedback loops in terms of, um, uh, what, what goes forward where. And so I'll say it both from the top, right? We know what our plans are and we know where our goals are, as I should say that. We know where our goals are. We know what our key performance indicators are. Um, and the system we set up um, with those key performance indicators is a dynamic system that we can update over time. So as things change, we'll be able to say, hey, look, these key performance indicators are moving, these aren't. Now these new systems are showing up. Are they helping us move these needles or not? is something we'll have a, a, a sense for um, over time. And then also, you know, emerging mobility, just like everything disruptive, is disruptive. And we will have to be uh, dynamic in, in when they can't show up. I mean, scooters showed up out of nowhere. Most people thought they were going to, you know, go bankrupt uh, within a year. They somehow survived through the pandemic. Um, so, you know, you never know. Um, and we need to just be on our toes. And that's why we set up an emerging mobility team uh, specifically to kind of be a radar, right? Um, hey, these new things are coming. What do we do for that? You know, we have urban air uh, deliveries uh, look like the next thing uh, that we really need to wrestle with. Um, things like that, uh, sidewalk delivery robots, right? And so there's, there's again, each, each technology emergence has its own characteristics, its own impacts and its own timelines. And all of them are unknown until they actually like work. Right, and so uh, we we do our best with the resources we have to stay abreast of that, stay involved in the national discussions around them, um, and um, uh, and and uh, yeah, spend the right resources or the amount of resources we can on on addressing those issues. So I know it's not a it's not a super concrete version, but I don't think there is a concrete answer um, in, in whole to that. Okay, thank you. Um, and then going back to the uh, VMT policy, there was a there was a little bit of talk about overriding consideration as long as it fits within the context, context of a general plan, but we do have a general plan amendment process, so I don't understand how that fits in to an overriding consideration if you're basing it just on the general plan, and I saw Michael put his hand up. Yeah. Looks like Michael Burrow wants to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, so the proposal now is that if you're Proposing housing on a site within the general plan where it's allowed, the policy would support going forward. If you're proposing a general plan amendment for housing um, in a high VMT area, um, then uh, 
you know, that we're not proposing, uh, you know, to change the policy to support that. You really need to, you really need to stay within, uh, you know, we, we're not trying to change the general plan. That's a larger issue, essentially. So we're trying. We're, our goal is to stay tried and true to the general plan, focus growth in areas the general plan allows them. Um, where they are high VMT areas uh, within the general plan, then you know there would be a secret process to innovate mitigations and and how you would how you could move forward. We're also you know reaching our climate goal, but we're not advocating or supporting changes that would have a policy that would support development in high VMT areas that can't be mitigated that are not already uh, uh, supported by our general plan. So, okay, so you mentioned housing multiple times and I understand that that's the thrust of the discussion, but what about other, other, air, other developments like schools, for example? All right, so if you're, if you're proposing so under our proposal, if you're proposing to convert a school site, um, I'm not saying convert a school site into housing. I'm saying to build a school. No, oh, that's already yeah. covered under the that's current. Covered, there's no yeah. change to that. There's no yeah. change. They're already allowed. Yeah, I think I think where what we're talking about is this, where the most common scenario is someone's proposing to convert a non-residential piece of land in a red high immitigable VMT area that's not um, supported by the general plan for residential growth. So I, I think a way to clarify your question is everything else has a way forward. The only thing that had a block on it was uh, 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 housing outside of, of urban villages, right? They, smaller projects could go forward fine, but it's these larger projects in those areas. And so that's the consideration that wasn't possible before. So we've opened that consideration. Right. And then there's this caveat of, you know, we, we don't want to see people come in and say, hey, we're just going to change the general plan so we can go do this. Right. And so um, there, there's a caveat around trying to figure out stopping that motion. OK, so that's putting a stricture on the council because we're the ones who decide whether a general plan amendment can go forward. So you're saying we could we could approve a general plan amendment and you could say, no, you can't actually do that. Well, no, no, we cannot say that. Yeah. yeah, the council can always direct staff to bring something to city council. All we're saying is what we're proposing is that the VMT policy would not support general plan amendments in immitigable VMT areas that are not growth areas for housing, that are not already growth areas for housing. Okay. Council member Prolis? Yeah, I, I, um, I'm trying to... Uh untangle this in my mind as well. But the way I was looking at it was that a potential project that maybe didn't fit, you know, the, the BMT policy today, and but maybe it's something that the council wanted to have an overriding consideration on, that it could in essence then, you know, get a GP amendment um, and and it would need two steps, I guess, right? It would need a, a general plan amendment and then it could, could come to the council on the BMT policy overriding consideration. But what I'm hearing is that that actually that that would not be the case that if it if a project applied for a general plan amendment but it didn't meet the vmt policy goals then it would just i, I don't know i guess die as an early consideration or a, you know an early denial or whatever it is and, and it wouldn't even make it to the council is that correct that am i understanding that correctly then not not well sort of but not entirely so um so in one sense yes the, the proposal that we have is not intended to have a go around that would, where the VMT policy would provide a path for someone to do a general plan amendment in a high in mitigable VMT area that's not a growth area for housing, for example. That being said, the council can always direct us to con continue processing a general plan amendment and bring it to council, and they could ultimately decide to do an override. It, the policy wouldn't support that, but it doesn't mean the council couldn't do that. So, for example, there, there, there is likely to be a general plan amendment that's, um, you know, that's been applied for that we will bring it to council for early consideration because it's fundamentally inconsistent with the general plan. It's not supported by the VMT policy. And then the question to council is, given these things, should you just, we would recommend you deny it. And council can say, yes, we agree with you staff, we're denying it, don't process this anymore, applicants stop spending your money. Or they could say, well, 
I think we'd really like to hear this one and direct staff to continue processing it and bringing it back at the next general plan hearing whenever it's ready. So that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't change. That, that's something that could happen now and, and we continue. All we're just saying is that the, can you, the can policy you itself walk, would not support that, right? Michael, can you walk me through how would the council uh, intervene there? Where, where would we find out about a general plan amendment like this and then have an opportunity to say, hey, we'd like to see this go forward. Would that be like a whoever's proposing the GP amendment would need to come to the council and say, hey, can you help this because it's, it's going to die? No. So what we, we, what, we, what we would do with something like this is what's called early consideration, um, which we haven't done in a while. But when we get general plan amendments that are fundamentally inconsistent with the general plan, we bring in the council relatively soon in the process. Often, you know, it'd be in May. Uh, right now, it'd probably be a little later than that because of our staffing situation. But you know, in the near future, I'd say the next two to three months, we bring it to council. Uh, first, it goes to planning commission. We bring it to council and saying, "Hey, we've got this general plan amendment. It's fundamentally inconsistent with the general plan, and it's inconsistent. The VMT policy does not support it. Therefore, we're going to recommend denial." Um, but in all fairness to the, applica the applicant, um, we were bringing it to council early. It could frankly be six months early or a year and a half early, depending on when they're going. Um, and do you council agree with uh, our, our analysis and recommendation? And in which case you would deny it so that the process would stop. The applicant isn't spending hundreds of you know, thousands of dollars in an EIR or the council could say, well, you know, we really do stu still want to consider this, continue processing it. So, you know, that usually happens. So, you know, the applications were due, well, the, it depends on what type of application it is, but, um, but the, 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 se the, the secondary deadline is in March. And so we would bring something in, in May. Um, I think we'll probably have something this year, frankly, it'd probably be more likely June that we bring it to council to, to say, hey, we want to get your read on this one. So it would come before you as a body to, to get direction. Okay, so it come before as a, an early consideration for Correct. denial, and then the council would have an opportunity to say, actually, we think this might be worthy of continuing an analysis on. Correct. And then, and then still subsequently at some point, we'd need to also override the, the VMT policy. So we, we're, we, we would be allowing the general plan amendment to continue. That's right. And, and, and then, then there would need to be a CEQA override, override, basically, yeah. If, if the council ultimately decides to to a, a approve what's being proposed. Okay, so that would be the 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 narrow path that a, a, a project that didn't currently fall within the the general plan amendment for housing. Um, would have to to follow in order for it to move forward, but it sounds like there is a path. It's obviously just uh, more hurdles to, to overcome in that regard. Right. Okay. Um, that, that's that'll do it for me for now. Thanks. Thank you. If there are no other questions from my colleagues, will we are ready for the vote? Just to confirm, this is coming back to the May second transportation and committee. Just, yeah. just, just the VMT policy. Okay, thank so you. To accept the report, but the for the VMT, the proposed changes to the VMT policy to come back to us. And we are agnostic. I think the motion was agnostic about whether it's May or June. Okay. Holy? Aye. Morales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And the next item three is bike plan 2025 and trail network annual report. John. Thank you again. And uh, this is a joint presentation by both the Department of Transportation and Parks and Recreation Neighborhood Services. So I'm going to turn this over to Brian. We also have Liz Sewell from Parks and Brent Purse from BTA to actually talk about all of the good things that are going on the bike and the trail network plan. So Ryan, I think you're up first. Yeah, and I think Liz, you were gonna have the first slide. Yes, thank you. 
Um, so good afternoon, committee members. My name is Liz Sewell, and I am the trail manager for the city's Department of Parks, Rec, and Neighborhood Services. And I'm joined today by uh, the Department of Transportation's Active Transportation Program Manager, Ryan Smith, and VTA Transportation Planner, Brent Pierce. And we're gonna give an annual update of the city's efforts towards building out its on-street on -street bikeways and trail network. So first, I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan to provide an update on the Better Bike Plan. Yeah, and really briefly uh, at a high level, just so you know what to expect in our presentation. As Liz mentioned, we're gonna do a status update on our uh, efforts to build out our bike plan and trail network, uh, give some key project updates, briefly touch on funding needs and strategies for trails and on-street bikeways, um, including this year's application for Transportation Development Act funding. And then as Liz mentioned, um, Brian from VTA will share a project update. Um, really quickly so for some background. So in October, 2020, council adopted a new bike plan. Uh, his goals for the on-street network are to uh, focus on safety, equity, and transportation mode shift. So opportunities for more folks to get on bikes um, with a vision of having a network that uh, is suitable for, for people of all ages and abilities to feel safe and comfortable with traveling around San Jose by bike um, with the goal of a 557 mile bikeways network at build out. Uh, just, you know, over the years, you can see we've made steady progress on building out our bike plan. Uh, and currently we have 436 miles of on-street bikeways completed. If you, if you combine this with the trails, it's almost a 500 mile network um, that's currently usable for people riding bikes in San Jose. The map on the right is really just to give you an example of kind of the extent to which the on-street bikeways network covers the city. Um, although this, the purple lines and the blue lines really just represent uh, bikeways that have striping and signage only. And we know that people really wanna see something of a higher quality if we're gonna really move folks on using bikes. So the, the green cluster in the center is representing our current protected bikeway network um, that's been built out and we wanna see this spread across the city. So that's kind of what our, our focus is gonna be on as we build out our bike plan. And I'm gonna kick it back over to Liz. Thanks, Ryan. So before we dig into the trail projects, I wanted to show the brand new version of the city's public facing trails map. So this was put together by our GIS department and in it, the green indicates the existing trails and orange indicates our planned trails. So um, also our parks department often teams with DOT to connect the trails across roads and bridges and um, to connect trails to bike lanes. So I'll give some specific examples later on in the presentation. Um, next. So thanks, Ryan. Um, here are the types of trails you can normally find in the city's trail network, along with a photo of the Coyote Creek Trail. And this photo was taken right before the trail opened to the public um, in mid-October. So that's why it looks so desolate. Um, a few recent, a few more recent accomplishments from this year include, in addition to opening this two miles of trail along Coyote uh, Creek, it includes this particular segment includes two crosswalks that we partnered with DOT on and um, a new trail safety pilot that we are piloting with the San Jose Conservation Corps. And the pilot aims to encourage the use of trails by enhancing the maintenance and landscaping and monitoring service along these new reaches of trail. Next slide. Great, great. So we're, um, the memo we submitted for this item uh, includes many specific uh, project updates and status. We're just gonna share a few key projects here. Um, so for on-street bikeways, last year we started to implement um, a pretty dramatic reconfiguration of 10th and 11th streets downtown, adding a frontage lane, which is shown in the bottom left um, of the slide to 10th and 11th streets where cars and bikes could share the roadway, um, kind of separate from through traffic. And uh, in the upper left, we also implemented a number of parking protected bikeways uh, on this corridor. And then you can see on the right, we've used what we call quick build uh, materials to quickly build out some intersection protection. 
And what we're moving forward with this year is upgrading a lot of this to permanent features, uh, which will help with safety and comfort of people using these as well as long-term maintenance goals. Um, so what you'll see this year is we're gonna start adding concrete to these intersections where you see the bollards currently. Also wanted to mention that um, this design you see in the upper left of the parking protected bikeway is something that we're you know, starting to implement in other parts of the city outside of downtown as well. Um, and then one other project update, excuse me, is uh, during COVID-19, uh, Metropolitan Transportation Commission released a funding source called the Safe and Seamless Mobility, Quick Strike Mobility Program, which was intended to give cities funding to quickly improve um, and build out street, uh, street facilities, bikeways. And we got about six and a half million dollars for four projects that we're currently um, in some stage of development, uh, design and, and kicking off outreach soon. And these are uh, upgrading the, for downtown, upgrading the, the plastic bollards from the Better Bikeways project, um, including connecting downtown to the BART station, um, a separated bikeway on Bascom Avenue, safety improvements along Juin and Key that will include safety improvements for bicyclists. And then also um, we, uh, another effort of our department is the East San Jose and Movie Miento uh, Multimodal Transportation uh, Improvement Program uh, plan, I should say. And we're gonna use quick strike funding to build out some of that. The two pictures here are East San Antonio Street and East San Jose, which um, will be upgraded as part of the quick strike project. Next slide. Thanks. So here you can see all of the phases of trail development from identify to open and constructed and open essentially. Um, so over the last nine months, we have completed 10 projects through various phases um, shown here. And I'll detail a few of our 27 active projects later in the presentation. Um, but each phase that a project goes through helps to develop the cost of future phases for things like discussion with council and approval by council and grant writing. Um, so that said, it makes it a bit difficult to estimate the full cost of build out, but a rough estimate for these remaining segments of trail uh, that you saw in the first slide that I showed with the map will be approximately 400 million. And that estimates a per, per mile cost of about 4 million. Um, and then in addition to that, bridges and underpasses. Next slide. So this, one of the two projects that we wanted to share with you today are uh, the Three Creeks Trail Project. Um, so it's one of a few active ones over the past couple of years. Uh, this slide shows the Three Creeks Bridge, which was implemented in early, it was implemented early last year. And currently we are, actually I'm in the process of scheduling a walkthrough um, with a couple departments of the, this portion of trail between Lonus and Co. And then next um, we have the, a trail connection between the uh, Lonus side of this bridge and the Las Gatas trail side of this bridge along the creek. So right now, basically you have to access Lonus Street in order to connect to Los Gatos, but we are in the late stages of design of a trail that will connect this along the creek. Um, next slide. And this slide shows the Five Wounds Trail in um, CD three and seven. This is a jam board from one of, our one of our three community meetings that we had over the course of last year. Um, it's for a feasibility study for this trail between William and, um, I'm sorry, Witten and Story. So these few projects have heavily involved partnership between PRNS and DOT. Um, this project in particular that you can see on the screen um, involved a couple of TAC uh, advisory committee meetings with DOT to strategize uh, road crossings for the trail. And then um, additionally, we are in uh, late stages of negotiation of the acquisition of the land north of this project so that we can begin um, planning the trail between Lower Silver Creek and William. 
And that's all for this slide. Thanks, Brian. Okay, great. Thanks, Liz. So now I want to move into uh, how we're funding build out of our bike plan. This is sort of separate from trails. We have separate funding and implementation processes and timelines. Um, as far as the bike plan funding goes, I want to draw your attention to the table on the right. This is cost estimates for the full build out of the bike plan, as well as build out for um, different sections of the bike plan, including our five-year priority projects. The cost range um, assumes on the low end that we do the entire thing with the quick build temporary materials like bollards. And on the right, um, the upper end is if we do everything with permanent materials. And you know, practically speaking, this will be some kind of combination of the two, but this sort of sets the, the stage for what we're talking about. We currently, this is unfunded, so we don't have a dedicated funding source. We chase grants and we try to coordinate with other plans and projects to leverage resources. So part of our funding strategy is to go after the big grants uh, coming up soon as the active trans transportation program from the state, uh, OBAG from the federal government. And then we also use our pavement maintenance program. That's kind of our biggest way to implement our bike plan. And that's an ongoing thing where we attach bike plan implementation to our paving program. We also do this with other things such as vision zero projects, uh, regional highway projects, for example. We also use private development. So uh, downtown West is a great example of getting um, the developer to help us build out our bike plan. Um, one more slide on funding. So the one guaranteed source we get every year is the state uh, grant source, the Transportation Development Act, Article 3, call it TDA 3, um, is a state tax that's allocated to cities based on population for bike and pedestrian improvements. This year, we're getting 1.4 million. Um, that's up from 1.1 million last year, which is great. Uh, we intend to apply for most of that for citywide bikeway implementation, which is basically design, outreach, construction of um, various segments of the bike plan. We're also gonna spend some of that on pedestrian safety improvements such as crosswalks and dedicate some of that funding to Vision Zero safety programming, programming education. So this is gonna come to council, uh, excuse me, this will go to our San Jose Bike and Pedestrian Advisory Committee this month and council most likely in May. Um, and now I'm going to uh, Hand this over to Brent Parse from VTA for. Uh... Hi, everyone. Happy to be a special guest here today to present to you all. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Central Bikeway, the Bay Area's first bike superhighway project. We've been working very closely with City of San Jose staff and in your communities to help develop the concept for this project. Bike superhighways are really transformational. They're meant to be high quality bikeways that help people travel over long distances safely, directly, and they're meant to include enhanced amenities to move bikes quicker through our cities. Uh, bike superhighways are completely separated from traffic and pedestrians, so they're bike-focused facilities mainly. Central Bikeway is consistent with the facilities identified in San Jose's bike plan, um, but it takes that plan, it builds on it, and it supercharges it along the identified route in District 3 and in District 4. It also is meant to focus on heavily disadvantaged communities, uh, particularly north of downtown, near Japantown, and in Santa Clara. It's a regional project. It really connects to the amazing trail network that the city has with three trail uh, corridors uh, interacting with it. Connects to the Barrios at BART station, Caltrain, and frequent VTA bus and rail services. Uh, we just finished the uh, study and it's a conceptual plan. It includes a 10% level of design. And this type of study and project really helps set a solid foundation for continuing our collaboration between VTA and the city. And it really sets up uh, this quarter for future funding opportunities like Ryan spoke about earlier. Next slide. You know, before we started this plan, we really wanted to recognize that we don't always have all the developed relationships with every community that we serve. Um, and we definitely don't have all the lived experiences that many uh, people in our communities have. So in order to really truly design a bikeway that we know people will use to get people out of their cars and shift their behaviors, we really wanted a project that really represents what people need, uh, the people that live and work in the study area. So we wanted to do something different with this project and 
we elected to um, contract and pay community-based organizations to work alongside us and our consultants to really help us collaborate with the community, which like um, City has done on other projects like Rams has presented on for Move San Jose. We ended up collaborating with three groups, the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy, Meta LLC, uh, which is a women-owned co-op in East San Jose, and the, the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. And these three groups were really instrumental at um, being in community during this tough time during the pandemic and helping us reach the audiences we need to, to design this great project. 47% uh, of people have told us um, of all those that participated that they would use a facility like a superhighway to go to work, to go to school, to shop along the route. And 30% of those that participated would be new bicycle users. So those are people that currently don't ride now. So what that tells us is a, is a facility like a superhighway can really help shift people uh, and make them think differently about how they can move in our cities. And this number is really, really high um, for a, a type of project like this. Normally we see that at about less than 5%. So we really believe that Central could maybe shift the needle in some places. And next steps for the project, we're gonna be applying for a grant in June to help advance the project's design and environmental work for the whole 10 mile corridor. And we look forward to continue working with you all. Okay, so that concludes uh, our update for this year and happy to, thank you for having us of course, and uh, we're happy to have discussion or open this up to questions. All right, thank you. We'll go to members of the public first and uh, the first person with their hand raised is Colin user three. I would like to ask for the timer to be set for one minute. We are running short on time and we still have two more items. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, you have one minute. Great, yeah, typical. Uh, Who's going to pay for all this stuff? I mean, it, it sounds nice, but uh, the questions I have for Pan and everybody else is, you know, what's, who's going to pay for the super highway? It, it sounds nice. And uh, at the moment, a lot of the bike lanes are terrible for both drivers and uh, cyclists. They're not very good. One on Cherry Avenue is good. Downtown, 10th and 11th Street, and eh, and eh, no good. No good for drivers. No good for cyclists. So I think there needs to be more done. Those ballasts or whatever they call them, whatever it is, those poles, those pla blue and plastic poles, what an eyesore. I mean, that downtown's already ugly enough when they put that in there. They got these bike lanes overtaking all these streets downtown. It's terrible. But once again, Cherry Avenue was done quite well for uh, all the paint on there, on the, on the uh, asphalt and everything is intuitive. Next speaker is Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for this item. Thanks for uh, the first presenter who uh, he hasn't uh, presented for quite a while. And it's, I didn't know if he was still in San Jose working on these sort of things. Good to see him still around. Uh, I guess, you know, my uh, first thing, you know, the ideas of accountability and openness with uh, policy making for the technology for these practices. Uh, it's really important to myself, and I hope we all want to make really uh, important efforts that, you know, th these are the ideas of our sustainable future, and we can't sell it short. We, I really don't think we can do that, and we have to look for ways to do, you know, that these open, openness and accountability can be really a part of a sustainable future, just as much as uh, bicycle trails and, and, and community safety and technology itself. Uh, practice uh, City of Davis. Thank you. Returning to my colleagues, Council Member Cohen. Hi. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions. First of all, do we get have any way of measuring through either poll surveys or any other data about um, trends in time of, of bicycle riding and usage? Uh, Council Member, this is Jessica Zink, Deputy Director for the Department of Transportation. We do use a few different sources to measure trends and, and usage and time. Some of them are pretty high tech and some of them are very low tech. So we will do 
uh, counts at individual uh, intersections uh, to measure the differences from different projects. Uh, we will also um, get, uh, we've gotten some big data sources that do uh, their best to estimate uh, people traveling, whether they're walking, whether they're biking, whether they're riding transit, driving, et cetera. We also have done a couple pilot programs to look at, um, at bicycling in specific areas, including on the trail through newer technology that can automatically count users. So we, we have a smattering. I will also add that as everybody um, knows, the last few years uh, have been uh, absolutely anomalous in terms of people's travel behavior in general, right? And so some of our typical data collection uh, practices uh, have not been deemed worth the money that they cost to do during the pandemic years. And so we have continued to try some metrics and collected data for individual projects, but I think we're all looking forward to getting back to a place where, you know, travel, it, you know, as we're seeing right now is uh, largely back and those practices can be put back into place more dependently. So we think that travel was down during the pandemic on bikes because people just weren't going out as much, or maybe it was up because people were doing more recreation? I think, yeah, what we saw in general was that travel overall, especially early in the pandemic, was down. And travel was up on bikes, but not higher than bike travel when people were going places, right? So everybody was traveling less, but the percent of trips by bike was higher. Uh, but that, you know, again, hard to measure kind of across the board or make generalities about it, but that was the overall trend during the pandemic. It'd be interesting if we kind of had some trends with time, maybe if we take out these years and maybe next year can yeah. learn more. Um, just just one more question. On the, on the bike highway picture on, I think it was slide 13 or 14, um, I know that there was some, some, there have been multiple proposals about how this gets through district four. Um, and, and the original design I saw had it going through down Oakland Road, which of course is difficult because of the, the A Oakland Road 880 interchange. Um, how has this current route been um, determined? And I guess another part of the question is that part of it, I, I think part of the original plan was to use the Guadalupe River Trail as part of that highway. And it doesn't look like it still is. So can you just talk a little bit about the, um, the, the route and how it's been determined and what the stages, where we are in terms of, of uh, planning and, and finalization of the route? Yeah, so the purpose of you know where we're at with the study right now is to do what we call an alternatives analysis. So that looks at different routes, different corridors, many of the ones that you just mentioned. And the outcome of that in our final study report which we now have on our website and I can make sure links get out to your office. Actually, I did send links to your office uh, last week now that I'm remembering, but I'll make sure that it gets to your staff again, is to show how we got to the final report, right? So how we ranked those alternatives based on our feedback and the criteria that we set forth. And you're correct, one of the earlier alternatives, we were considering various a road, but we elected to shift the alignment down 10th and 11th and use Taylor um, based on um, that corridor being identified as mainly to be for transit or multimodal users and the, cor the corridor on Barrier set to be more auto-oriented with the shift that the city is making towards looking at a new interchange there at that location. Yeah, so this all depends on where that interchange gets placed, I guess, in, Correct. In, since we're heading towards Barrier so Road. So that, that eastern part, I couldn't quite tell from the map, that eastern part is along Mabry Road and down Taylor. All the way Correct. Through. Mayberry, Taylor, 10th and 11th, and then down heading uh, west to Alameda and Alameda to El Camino Real and Santa Clara. Okay. Yep. All right. And I'd be happy to schedule a direct briefing with your office if you like to go to go over any details. Okay. Thank you. I guess I'll move acceptance of the report. Is there a second? Okay, I'll second that. And uh, I think, oh, Council Member Sparza. Council Member Sparza, you're on mute.
Sorry, I'm having uh, technical issues. We can hear um, you now. Yeah, great. Thank you. I'm pushing different buttons. Hey, I actually just wanted to um, thank, I know we're going to talk about it on NSE, but I wanted to um, thank uh, Public Works, thanks Park and Rec, um, thank DOT, uh, thank Valley Water and the Conservation Corps and the SJPD for all working together on the Coyote Creek um, safety plan, including the bike patrol. And I think that's something that I think we need to acknowledge is that people will use our, our trails, um, they'll bike them if it's clean and safe, right? And if they don't feel safe, they're not going to do it. And I think that's a big message that everyone needs to, that, that we need to keep in mind. That's it for me. Thank you. Excellent point, Council Member as far as I appreciate you making it. I think uh, seeing no more hands, we are ready for the vote. Foley? Foley? Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes, and I see that Council Member Foley is unmuted, so you can call her again. Aye. <laughs> Thank How are you. you? Thank you. All right, that motion carries and we will move to item four, City Roadmap San Jose Clean Energy Programs Roadmap Status Report. Great, thank you, Council Member. Um, so I'm Lori Mitchell and I'm the Director of Community Energy. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by Joe Flores, who is our Deputy Director of Account Management and Willie Calvin, who is our Power Resource Specialist. This item is our annual programs roadmap update. And so as you recall, as we have updated this over the years, in the early years of San Jose Clean Energy, we have really prioritized leveraging external funding to fund these programs, which has been very successful. So you'll see here are some updates on how we have um, successfully gained external funding to, to fund many of these initiatives really focused on energy efficiency and electric vehicles. And I'm also pleased to report we're going to provide a quick update on, you know, where we are at in terms of some of our financial metrics. And so pleased to report that this year should be a much more favorable year for us financially. That's largely due to the PCA being lower. So we should be in a position to both pay back commercial paper and to have 90 days of operating expenses in a reserve this next fiscal year. Our next benchmark is to increasing that to 180 days, which we expect to occur in 2024 to 25. And then once we reach that benchmark, um, in addition to leveraging the external funding, um, we expect to be able to fund um, much more fully these programs, as well as potentially offering some rate savings. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to Joe Flores. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, Joe Flores, Deputy Director, Community Energy Department. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So as Lori mentioned, uh, we are going to be asking for the committee to accept the status update on San Jose's Clean Energy Programs Roadmap that we provide annually. And we will uh, remind the committee the background of the structure in which we re make program recommendations. We will then quickly move into giving you a, a status of our existing programs and then talk about our recommendations for near-term programs as well as future programs, and then conclude with uh, what are the next steps for the committee and, and, and for this milestone, uh, next road step, road, roadmap milestones, excuse me. Next, please, Lori. So as Lori mentioned, you know, we want to be able to ensure that there's financial resilience, resiliency in our organization before we start looking at using additional uh, funds for programmatic work. And so we are going to continue to leverage external funding until we build up our operating reserves. Um, but we mentioned that we are seeking to be able to reach 180 days of operating expenses. And that resiliency will pro then provide that cushion against the volatility that we see in the power markets and PCI uncertainty that was very well pronounced in 2021, but we're looking to much favorable conditions in 2022. And so um, we are on track to be able to get to 180 days, hopefully within the first five years of operation. And that would be between the years 24 and 25, if, if not sooner. Next, please. 
So staff did develop this program's roadmap uh, between 2019 and 2021, which there was significant amount of input from various stakeholders, such as uh, you know, our commercial and residential customers, as well as our um, community energy commission. And the roadmap was accepted by city council in March of 2021. Next, please. It's very important that as a department within the city that we are completely aligned with climate smart. And so with this uh, frame, this uh, slide shows you ex exactly which pillars we are aligned with. And the dotted lines around um, some of the squares on the bottom show specifically where our program roadmap does align with climate smart. And this is becoming even more important as we uh, strive towards reaching the uh, ambitious goal of, you know, the bold goal of getting to carbon neutral by 2030. Next, please. And so the program roadmap focuses on six program areas. And these program areas are um, what you listed there in electrification, efficiency rates, resiliency, and distributed en energy resources. These are the program areas that we focus on. It's also the program areas that we see several other um, community choice aggregators in the Bay Area focus on, as well as other utilities. And within these program areas, we then have specific selection criteria. Go to the next slide, please. These are the program uh, guiding principles selection criteria, which we're able to then specifically measure each program using these principles. Uh, they include greenhouse gas reduction opportunities, how it aligns with climate smart, and whether or not it's promoting equity and affordability in, in disadvantaged communities, as well as producing additional community benefits and improving the financial stability of San Jose clean energy. And so we use these um, uh, focus areas as well as principles to develop a short, ter a short, um, short term list of recommendations for, um, for us to implement first. And so what we're gonna move into next is we're gonna give you an update of what those programs were and what their current status is. And I'm gonna turn that over to Willie Calvin to give you an update. Is Willie available? Um, I... We can't hear you, Willie. I, I can see you talking. Can you hear me now? We can. There yeah. we go. Okay, thank great. You. Sorry about that. Um, so, so thank you, Joe. Um, so, so first, we'll start with uh, our existing programs and. As you can see, we have four programs, each in different uh, four different program areas. Two of these on the left-hand side are CPUC funded programs, and we have one as well in the vehicle electrification program area that is funded by the CEC and San Jose Clean Energy. Um, and then lastly, we have our program specific rate SJ CARES. Next slide, please. So for our energy efficiency program, this is one of the CPUC funded programs. Um, we're really excited to announce that uh, last month we executed the agreement with the program implementer, Franklin Energy. Um, so now officially the program planning and development and um, activities are underway and we are aiming to launch the program, the programs in May. Um, so in total, this is uh, $5.1 million from the CPUC and about $500,000 in American Rescue Plan funds. Um, so for the commercial program side of things, um, we have 4.3 million from the CPUC funding, and this will provide small and medium businesses and schools with technical assistance and discounts for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning upgrades and equipment. Um, and we're targeting over the three years of the program, we're targeting 300 businesses, projects, and nine schools. Um, and then on the single family residential side of things, uh, we have about 750,000 in CPUC funding combined with 500,000 from the American Rescue Plan funds for a total of 1.25 million. Um, this will provide discounts to middle income uh, residents and folks in disadvantaged communities in San Jose. Uh, provide, it will provide them discounts for energy efficient appliances. Um, and this will uh, aims to serve about 1,060 single family homes. Next slide. 
Uh, our next program is the other CPUC funded program. So this is the Disadvantaged Community Green Tariff Program. Uh, we've branded it as Sol the Solar Access Program. Um, so this provides low income customers in disadvantaged communities in San Jose a 20% bill discount on 100% renewable energy. Uh, and there's no solar installation or any type of installation needed for this. So this is a great opportunity for uh, renters and folks who otherwise would not have access to solar. Um, we were allocated a 1.7 megawatt program capacity, which allows us to have about 800 customers as program participants. Uh, we began enrolling those customers in November of 2021. And before that enrollment, uh, we sort of did a big batch enrollment and we did a lot of outreach and worked with local community-based organizations to ensure that Spanish and Vietnamese speaking residents had access to the program. So all in all, we had more than 700 applicants and we're really excited. We were really pleased to, that over 40% of those applicants spoke either Vietnamese or Spanish. And currently uh, there are more than 600 residents enrolled and we're still working with those CBOs to fill the last two, about 200 spots in the program. Next slide, please. Uh, in the way of vehicle electrification, uh, we have the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project, otherwise known as Cal EVIP. So this is funded by the California Energy Commission and San Jose Clean Energy, um, and it's implemented by the Center for Sustainable Energy, um, and that's implemented statewide uh, by that organization. Um, so this program provides rebates uh, for publicly available and shared charging stations that install level two and direct current fast chargers. Um, as of March 2022, the, the program implementer announced uh, an additional 2.4 million incentives for level two chargers. Um, reservations for incentives filled up very quickly in this program. Um, so that extra 2.4 million for level two will basically be going to folks who are still on the waiting list. Um, so throughout 2022, these projects are gonna start receiving their incentives. There's, there's two payments. Um, and then we expect throughout this year and next year for the projects to complete. Next slide, please. And so last but certainly not least is our SJ CARES discount program. So this was established by council in May of 2021. Um, and this provides San Jose Clean Energy Care FARA customers uh, with an additional 5% discount. So that means that they receive a higher renewable energy a higher renewable um, percentage of their energy than PG&E and at the lowest rates in San Jose. Um, so that that's a, a, those are updates on our existing programs that kind of came out of that program's roadmap. And I'll hand it back to Joe to go over some of the near term program recommendations. Thank you very much, Willie. So um, we mentioned that we're gonna be continuing to leverage external funding and when we, what we consider near-term programs are programs that we're looking at uh, if between three and five years of being able to do significant work or, or, or actually launch that program. And so we are looking at um, federal funds that we believe are gonna become available probably around the fall of this year. We're waiting for details to come out. So we wanna be able to ensure that we, we can um, coordinate our efforts with the Climate Smart Teed as well as the other city departments to be able to go after those funds and um, as well as go after additional other funds that may be available through CPUC programs as well as California Energy Commission and other uh, state and local, uh, federal and local, uh, state and local programs. But once we do that, we wanna be able to focus our attention on these particular areas. The first one is building electrification. And that is being able to use heat pump technology for both water heating and space heating in both commercial and residential spaces. We also uh, heard from outside consultants that there are so much, there's so many programs in existence already, and there's quite a process to being able to do building electrification, such as going through permits and so forth, that if we were able to establish a clearinghouse of electrification resources, that would greatly assist uh, uh, the public and, and to be able to go through that process of being able to implement uh, building electrification today. The next is we're looking at uh, program specific rates. You know, this is an idea that was uh, shared with us where we're coining it calling community total green. And this is where um, voluntarily customers may contribute an additional amount 
to uh, on top of what they pay for their services on their electric bill, in order to sponsor 100% renewable energy for those customers that are currently on the, the SJ CARES program. And so we'd have to be able to flesh this out and provide the details, but we believe that this, has a, this, this program has a lot of potential. Moving on to vehicle electrification, um, we would like to be able to look into a model and develop a pilot in which we would use city-owned parking assets and San Jose and Clean Energy would look to be able to develop the um, capital needed to be able to install fast charging at those uh, locations, especially those locations that are not being served by commercially available uh, charging stations. And these can focus on disadvantaged communities, those areas near multifamily housing, for example, that um, they have greater barriers to being able to adopt electric vehicles and so forth as well as uh, other commuters that are traveling through the region, such as uh, those on the major highways and thoroughfares, as well as local businesses who may you know, want to be able to have charging available for their customers as well as their employees. So that's one really exciting uh, opportunity that we're looking at. And that involves including looking at the opportunity of diversifying our revenue resources by operating, possibly operating those uh, charging stations as well. And this provides opportunities for the city as well to be able to collect the uh, utility user stack that uh, is associated with the increased electric usage. Um, and so there's opportunities on both sides for both the city and for San Jose Clean Energy as part of doing this uh, a pilot. We are also looking at uh, additional charging infrastructure that we may be able to get from federal funds and others um, to be able to look at critical infra uh, to be able to look at um, um, other charging infrastructure that may be uh, necessary for both our customers as uh, residential as well as commercial. And finally, on the resilience and distributed energy resources, we'd like to be able to look at um, using an external funding for developing local generation resources. That is um, looking at ways of actually building locally within here, within San, uh, San Jose, and being able to connect that directly to the grid and other opportunities there. We're also looking at um, being able to look at solar and storage for uh, other critical facilities, facilities here within the city. These could be city operated facilities as well as other uh, perhaps facilities operated by nonprofit organizations that are critical for you know, the, the community. And we're also looking at demand response programs. These are programs where customers can voluntarily be able to shift the way that they're using electricity in order to benefit the grid. This coming summer, we are going to be participating in the um, emergency load reduction program that's being sponsored by the state. Um, there will probably be in the neighborhood of about 150,000 residential customers that will be automatically enrolled in the program. And even though they're automatically enrolled, they will not be uh, required to participate. And other customers will also be uh, have the ability to, to participate in this program. But it offers a, a unique opportunity for us to be able to see how customers are responding to the call to be able to save energy during those critical, critical points. But we also want to look at how we can develop demand response programs based on our particular needs within our community, as well as the um, energy usage patterns that we see within our city. So that's what we're looking at in terms of near-term program recommendations. And I'm gonna to move to future programs. So these would be programs that we would consider more like perhaps five years out. However, since we come to the uh, committee every year, of course, there's flexibility to be able to uh, adapt to the changing environment and conditions. So looking out into the future, of course, residential home electrification, there will uh, need to be a lot more work done in this space. So we talked about um, being able to replace appliances in there. And of course, when you start to replace these appliances in the home, it adds the additional complication or additional work that uh, perhaps it could require a panel upgrade to be able to deliver this amount of energy to be able to provide uh, electric cooking as heat pump and water space heating workshops to be able to um, not only provide this to the uh, residents and, and businesses, but also those contractors that wish to provide this as a service as well, provide that type of information. And one of the more difficult uh, 
um, buildings to be able to provide electrification as multifamily or low income electrification support. So we wanna be able to work collaboratively again with our climate smart partners, as well as the other city departments to be able to try to tackle uh, being able to electrify these, un these housing units. Moving over to passenger uh, vehicle electrification, we wanna be able to look at those requirements that are being uh, placed on our commercial customers that, to be able to electrify their fleets. We'd like to be able to look at it, that as an opportunity to be able to shape how they're using and, and charging those so that it's being done at those times during the day when we have the most renewable energy available and we be able to reduce those whenever we're, uh, there's other greenhouse gas emissions that are related to that, those portions of the day. We, all want to, we would like to be able to provide a clearinghouse or information about how to be able to purchase and all the rebates that are available for, for purchasing those uh, either a new or used vehicle and be able to provide that clearinghouse so that it makes it much easier for that, for that adoption to happen. And then again, we wanna be able to support low income electric mobility, whether that's electric bicycles, electrifying our um, uh, public transportation fleets, as well as uh, uh, electric vehicles themselves. And then finally, moving on to uh, resiliency and distributed energy resources. We think that um, in the future, there is going to be a, a more availability, availability of energy storage that can be used by both commercial and residential along with adding solar and other renewable energy resources and being able to use those at the most strategic times that adds the best, most benefit to both the customer as well as managing um, uh, reliability here locally. And finally, you know, there's a lot of talk and work being done, being able to take all of this, the uh, battery storage that's happening in vehicles and develop the technology so that we can actually use that as a resource to be able to integrate it into the grid. And we're excited about that, uh, those technologies developing and, and our participation and role being able to facilitate that adoption. Next, please. So, so what, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, we're, um, we're running really short on time and we have another item. I'm, I'm, I know you're getting close to the end, but can I just refer my colleagues to, if you want to just show this slide for next steps and then we'll go to the public for, um, for their comments. So Absolutely. We've, thank you. we've got a next, uh, an update in 2023. Thank you. All right. We're going to go to the public. Um, the hand raised is Colin user three. And again, this will be one minute. You are no talk of what it's going to cost per kilowatt hour now, is there? I uh, haven't seen anything on that. Uh, no talk on how to update the grid that is already terrible in this town, uh, thanks to uh, PG&E. Uh, you know, there's no more natural gas anymore, so everything's going to go electric. That's going to be a disaster. You know, look no further than Germany and see what happens when you try to go carbon free and green and all that. It sounds good. It's great for offsetting. I, I agree. But uh, uh, take a look at Germany right now and see what they're going through. And uh, that'll be San Jose in the next, I don't know, three to five years. Uh, and uh, it'll be a disaster and it'll be super expensive and you're going to probably freeze to death. So at least in the winter time, not so much in California, it'd be too hot. Won't be able to turn your air conditioner on. We'll have to use like swamp coolers or something if we even have the grid to do that. But I just hope you guys could do something good with this. Thank you. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Good luck to keeping uh, San Jose Community Energy uh, working towards uh, an open and accountable process for all parts of the community in 2022, 23, and 24. Uh, good luck that Lori Mitchell can hopefully talk with uh, Martha O'Connell, uh, who she's uh, concerned about the future of uh, all electrification of buildings for mobile homes. And I think- uh, Blair, that's uh, off topic. Okay, you two could have a good conversation on that subject matter. Uh, to conclude, uh, you know, I, I've been very worried, uh, you know, for the past few years that 2023 was gonna be an important pivotal year. Uh, for some reason, is it because of Putin? We we have to really be concerned about our use of uh, renewables right now, and and not give in to the big fossil fuel U.S. push that will be happening right now. Uh, good luck to local procurement. 
uh, of renewables and just overall renewable good practices. Thank you. Turning back to the, my colleagues, Council Member Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Um, just uh, quickly, um, I assume that some of these conversations about how we um, convert to some of this electrification will be part of the conversation coming back to Council in June for the overall um, 2030 roadmap discussion. I can see a nodding head, so I guess that's good good enough answer for now. Because um, some of these topics are really important to gloss over, and I, I know we have a long agenda today, so I don't want to get into detail if we'll have an opportunity to do that soon. Um, yeah, so. I believe you're going to be seeing a building electrification plan as well as a transportation plan, and we've been uh, collaborating with that and we'll be available also to answer questions at that time. And we'll have some data that, that you know, it's not only a question of what the kilowatt hour cost of electricity is, but you know, the, given that the escalation of natural gas costs will probably be even greater, during the same period of time, you know, we need to be comparing the cost to the user for all the various options. And I think the data is showing us electrification is a better deal for everyone. Um, for EV, um, though, I, I want to make sure we're not delaying too much longer getting back to some of the things we had talked about happening before the pandemic in terms of getting people um, trained and uh, or having, having programs to help people um, electrify and, and learn the cost benefit analysis of electrification and giving them the resources they need to, to, to begin to convert when they get their new vehicles. Um, so maybe not for now, maybe at some point having that conversation here at T&E again this year I, would be useful. Yeah, I'd be happy to do so. Okay, um, so I'm, I, I don't know if I want to make them Maybe I'll make a motion that says I'll accept the report and ask for a discussion on on uh, EV conversion and uh, programs to assist EV conversion sometime later this year on t &E. As long as it's not May or June, I'm, I'm okay with that motion. <laughs> <I'll> second. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Any other comments or questions for my colleagues? All right, we're ready for the vote. Holy, aye. Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Esparza? Yes. yes. Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Certainly uh, last, but certainly not least, we have the City Roadmap Climate Smart San Jose Plan semi annual report. And I think, Julie, you're up. Am I right? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm today by Jessica Zank from DOT as well as Lori Mitchell um, talking about some of the programs that we've already discussed so we can kind of probably go through those pretty quickly. And Julie, I just wanna make sure your team knows we are likely to lose quorum around 4.45. So we're gonna need you to keep this to 10 minutes. Yep, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about updates and looking forward. So um, just a, a, a little background, you know, we all know Climate Smart was adopted in 2018. We have our carbon neutral goal, which was um, adopted for 2021, or 2021, sorry. So um, we have been working with Climate Smart through the American Cities Climate Challenge since 2019. Um, that work is going to be that assistance is going to be concluding in June of this year, and we're already ramping down on that. As unfortunately, we lost uh, one of our um, our climate advisor this past week to another position. Um, so, just a little bit on some of the Climate Smart Core activities um, in terms of the resources we've been able to acquire since um, the, the in this fiscal year, over six million in external resources, um, both in direct funding and in kind. Re at, um, activities um, in the city, and we have another 1.6 million that's um, already um, out there with applications in. We're waiting to hear back on those. We know a lot more money is coming down the road, and we are preparing for that already, looking out for it, um, you know, doing some pre pre work in order to, to be ready. Um, and our Efforts are being recognized on a continual basis. So this year we again have been recognized by the CBP, 
um, which was a carbon disclosure project previously, and then also um, CEEE um, ranking very high on their list for our climate efforts. So just in terms of our community um, engagement, a couple of highlights, we have a new program called Go Green Teams, which um, is a pilot uh, where we have 40 team leaders um, in order to allow them to host um, nine meetings, which includes five to 10 households. Uh, those meetings uh, cover topics like food and waste, home, en home energy, transportation, water, climate resilience and disaster preparedness. So across many departments in the city, um, and also um, so, so provide them with re resources on those as well as to track progress through our Climate Smart Challenge platform. That first cohort is gonna finish up in July and we're planning to refine and uh, come out with a, a cohorts in the next fiscal year. We also um, have advertised for our third annual Climate Smart Champions Awards um, that actually has already closed. We um, set that out in February will be recognizing awards at their April 19th city council uh, meeting. And I'll just pass it on over to Lori if she wants to cover anything on this slide. Sure, thank you, Julie. I'll be very quick. So just a couple of things to highlight. Um, you know, we're really happy that our default product is 60% renewable. We are still a leader in the CCA space in terms of the renewable content of our um, main product, which is green source. It's also 95% carbon free. And at the end of last year, really excited that two of our long-term renewable contracts actually completed construction and came online. Um, that's a large wind farm in New Mexico developed by Pattern Energy, and then a, a large solar and storage project here in California. I'll skip over the EE programs because you just heard about that. And then of course, very proud of that solar access program for our disadvantaged communities and still looking for about 200 additional residents to enroll in that where they get 20% bill discount and 100% renewable energy. Good afternoon. I'm going to go ahead and take this slide on the um, programs and policies focused on a connected and focused growth city. Uh, you've heard a great deal from us in transportation already today, especially about the Better Bike Plan and Trail Network. We did want to let you know we will be bringing uh, forward additional information about the transportation demand management and parking ordinance. Uh, we're planning to come to you with a framework in June at the City Council to make sure we're on the right track and get your insight into that. We're also working hard on the electric vehicle front in terms of charging infrastructure, upping the amount of, of charging, especially level two and fast chargers that are available for our community with the demand, including through the California EV infrastructure project. Thanks, Jessica and Lori. Um, so just in terms of our pillar three highlights, um, the building reach code is gonna require an update um, because there's a new 2022 California building code. Uh, we also have passed the natural gas infrastructure prohibition ordinance after the adoption of the building reach code. Um, and so we'll just be aligning that. We're planning to bring that um, later on this year. Um, we'll also be just looking at how the, the California building code and how other um, groups and counties in the area are looking at the EV requirements and see whether um, there's anything that might be needed around that portion. Um, and then uh, our existing building electrification plan, which is a framework to encourage electrification of homes and businesses. We've released our draft in, in February, 2022. We heard both support and concerns and we're gonna be making revisions to the plan and uh, providing council members with briefings and anticipate um, bringing that back, actually uh, looking towards June, uh, June 14th for that. So I know we're still a little bit on scheduling. Um, And then just looking ahead, um, we have August uh, 2022. And then we have several um, council items that are also planned. Some of that have been mentioned in previous presentations today. Um, quite a bit coming up though on the climate smart front. And uh, we'll just...
right, thank you. We will go to members of the public. Call in user three. Well, with the speed up of the meeting, I didn't understand one thing at all. Like it, I, this was a waste of time because I it wasn't well explained at all. It didn't make sense of anything, like a lot of things down at City Hall. But uh, yeah, maybe give your people more time. I don't know what you know. You guys are public servants, and you you know you cut time for callers. You cut time for the people presenting. You know. You work for the public. You don't work for yourselves, and it's it's a bit rude to speed everybody up. You guys, you know, and you should maybe have these throughout the week versus try to cramming things in on Monday and Tuesday for hours on end. You should be ashamed of yourselves. Claire, hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thank you. That I, you know, I'm hearing that you know uh, these. The clean clean energy programs, local clean energy, is inviting local uh, low income people more to their process more, using low income uh, uh, references more, and that's really nice to hear. And just thank you. Uh, working for a full community process is important, but uh, the fact that we are now including low income in these sort of conversations about the future of sustainable energy, uh, renewable energy, is awesome to hear. Keep up the good work in that area. And I don't want to put uh, Lori Mitchell on the spot at all, but you know, for over the past few years, she would very often talk about the importance of what 2023 meant to our future at, in the, of community energy. I've offered my, uh, several theories now on what I feel may be happening in 2023. I hope we can all work to understand what can be really what can be happening that year and, and, and learn conversation to how to have that openly and. you. Turning to my colleagues, are there questions or comments on this item? Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to, to staff and appreciate uh, the, the expediency on the report. Uh, and I'll mention I, I did uh, gather um, the, the full report from staff and um, I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right, thank you. We are ready for, uh, well, actually, yep, we're ready for a vote. Rob? Did you want to? Oh, yeah, Julie, do you need a referral to council on this item? Um, we are planning to go to council April 26th, yes, with this okay. item. Okay, but no, no referral needed. All right, thank you. Oli? Aye. Perales? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We will move now to open forum. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. With only one minute, I'll try to make it as general as I can. Um, I have been trying very hard. Sorry about that. I've been trying very hard to um, follow the MTC's new plan, Envision 2050, and I've read that whole thing. Well, almost. That's not fair to say. Um, and they've got new graphics and they've got a new equity plan and this and that and the other. And so today, after today's meeting and hearing us discuss how we're basically going to kind of scrap our own general plan. I mean, let's kind of face it. You know, we got rid of planning horizons. They didn't work. We got rid of community commercial spaces under affordable housing in urban villages. We agreed signature project could go ahead of urban village plans. Urban village plans can go without having an actual plan hired by a consultant, et cetera, et cetera. Our plan has not worked. In short, MTC has, is infusing kind of a new plan. And today was a good example of why it's very hard to trust, you know, our government because this continues to change and change and change and change. And so we're kind of whiplash. What is going on? Thanks. Thank you, Blair. 
Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, a really interesting meeting today. It was very hopeful about what is our future of sustainability. Uh, thank you. I think we're trying to address, um, you know, in this country and in our local communities, uh, I think since 9-11, we're trying to learn a concept of ideas of peace and not war. And uh, China, you know, the U.S. had 9-11, China has this COVID issue, Russia has had, you know, what they're going through right now. And what we're doing right now in San Jose is just steadily building a future of peace, sustainability, open democracy, uh, good practices, basically. I mean, we're asking, it's time we stop war. And the work that I do with openness and accountability is directly meant to address the ideas of peace and open democracy that can end the ideas of war as how to solve our issues. So good luck in what we're doing right now. We're doing something important. I think we can build something really great for our future. Thank you. Thank you. Call on user three. A lot of crime in the Southern division. It's been going on for decades. Uh, a little over three years ago, Bambi Larson was uh, brutally murdered uh, not far from where I live. San Jose PD called it a tragedy, not a murder. Uh, there was a meet, town hall meeting that was a complete joke about it. And now what do we have? You guys lobbied the state of California for speed cameras. And there was a and there was a just barf city kind of editorial that Dev Davis wrote in the paper this weekend that just made me want to puke about having to have 50 officers for traffic enforcement. That's what you guys come up with. Where do you find all, where are you going to find all the money for that? when we've had bad crime overnight for decades in the Southern Division. And presto, you guys got zero vision. you got enough money for speed cameras and more, more traffic cops that are going to work eight to four, you know, hiding. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned.